Oh, heck. I just now realized I had the music turned down. I'm so sorry, everyone. Thank you for dropping in. Uh, Batman, good to see you. It's been a hot minute. Uh, Road, hello, good to see you. Um, well, surprised to see you a second. <laughs> you two are not usually uh, who I first see in the chat, but I'm delighted to have you. Thank you. Rage, hello. <laughs> it's good to see you again. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's turn the screen on here and let everybody see that, it, yes, I am around. Um, and I hope everybody's been doing quite well. Um, as usual, I do like to, uh, start out with a bit of a sound test. Um, I know I've done my best to make sure that this is going to sound okay, but, um, as you can tell, it's doesn't always work out, um, especially when I'm not paying attention to the background music. So, um, if there is anybody in chat who would like to let me know uh, whether or not we've got our sounds uh, ready for tonight here, I would appreciate it. Well, okay. I uh, suppose I've not got rage on my lap. Um, all right, I'll just be a little cutie there then, okay? Or, moreover, I, I know we do have a bit of an agreement there. We'll, we'll handle that later. But it is uh, definitely a particular vibe that uh, you give off when you decide to immediately hop up in a storyteller's lap. So, um... Alright. I'm also going to assume that I sound okay. So, let's begin some of our more, uh... We'll switch the music over to something a little more story-oriented. And let's begin here. Chapter 7, in which Kanga and Baby Roo come to the forest, and Piglet has a bath. Nobody seemed to know where they came from, but there they were in the forest, Kanga and Baby Roo. When Pooh asked Christopher Robin, How did they come to be here? Christopher Oh, Pooh asked Christopher Robin, How did they come to be here? Christopher Robin said, In the usual way, if you know what I mean, Pooh. And Pooh, who didn't, said, Oh! <laughs> Hello, Kevry, thank you for dropping in. Then he nodded his head twice and said, In the usual way. Ah! Then he went to call upon his friend Piglet to see what he thought about it. And at Piglet's house, he found Rabbit. So they all talked together. What I don't like about this, said Rabbit, Here we are, here are we, you Pooh, and you Piglet, and me. And suddenly... And Eeyore, said Pooh. And Eeyore. And then suddenly... And Owl. And Owl. And then all of a sudden... Oh, and Eeyore. I was forgetting him. Here we are, said Rabbit very slowly and carefully. All of us. And then suddenly we wake up one morning, and what do we find? We find a strange animal among us. An animal of whom we have never even heard before. An animal who carries her family about with her in her pocket. Suppose I carried my family about with me in my pocket. How many pockets should I want? Sixteen, said Piglet. Seventeen, isn't it? And one more for a handkerchief. That's eighteen. Eighteen pockets in one suit. I haven't time. Hello, Sarada. Thank you for joining. It's been entirely too long since we got a chance to speak. I'm glad you've chosen to drop in tonight. Uh, we are doing more adventures of Winnie the Pooh, and uh, there's a bit of a fuss in the Hundred Acre Wood, for Kanga and Roo have appeared. There was a long and thoughtful silence. And then Pooh, who had been frowning very hard for some minutes, said, I make fifteen. 
what? Fifteen. I'm glad you want to hear the story. Fifteen what? Your family. What about them? Phil rubbed his nose and said that he thought Rabbit had been talking about his family. Did I? Yes, you did. Never mind. Never mind, Pooh. The question is, what are we going to do about Kanga? Oh, I see, said Pooh. The best way would be this. The best way would be to steal Baby Roo and hide him, and then when Kanga says, Where is Baby Roo? We say, Aha! 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 And of course, he went on. We could say, Aha! Even if we hadn't stolen Baby Roo. Pooh, said Rabbit kindly, you haven't any brain. I know said Pooh humbly. We say aha so that Kanga knows that we know where Baby Roo is. Aha means we'll tell you where Baby Roo is if you promise to go away from this forest and never return. Now, don't talk while I think. <laughs> Hello, Lexi. Well, we're talking about kidnapping a baby kangaroo inside the story, so I'm hoping that will help clear your head a little. Who went into a corner and tried saying, Aha! in that sort of voice. Sometimes it seemed to him that it did mean what Rabbit said, and sometimes it seemed to him that it didn't. I suppose it's just practice, he thought. I wonder if Kanga will have to practice too so as to understand it. This is one thing, said Piglet, fidgeting a bit. I was talking to Christopher Robin, and he said that a kanga was generally regarded as one of the fiercer enemies. I am not frightened of fierce animals in the ordinary way, but it is well known that if one of the fiercer animals is deprived of its young, it becomes as fierce as two of the fiercer animals, in which case, aha, uh -huh, is perhaps a foolish thing to say. Piglet, said Rabbit, taking out a pencil and licking the end of it. You haven't any pluck. It is so hard to be brave, said Piglet, sniffing slightly, when you're a very small animal. Rabbit, who had begun to write very busily, looked up and said, It is because you are a very small animal that you will be useful in the adventure before us. Piglet was so excited at the idea of being useful that he forgot to be frightened anymore, and when Rabbit went on to say that Kangas were only fierce during the winter months, being at other times of an affectionate disposition, he could hardly sit still. He was so eager to begin being useful at once. What about me? said Pooh sadly. I suppose I shan't be useful. Never mind, Pooh. Uh, another time, perhaps. Without Pooh, the adventure would be impossible. Oh, said Piglet, and he tried not to look disappointed. But Pooh went into a corner of the room and said proudly to himself, Impossible without me! That sort of bear! Thank you for the hearts. I appreciate them. Now listen, all of you said Rabbit when he had finished writing, and Pooh and Piglet sat listening very eagerly with their mouths open. This was what Rabbit read out loud. General remarks. Kanga runs faster than any of us, even me. More general remarks. Kanga never takes her eye off Baby Roo except when he's safely buttoned up in her pocket. Therefore, if we are to capture Baby Roo, we must get a long start because Kanga runs faster than any of us, even me. C1. A thought. If Roo had jumped out of Kanga's pocket and Piglet had jumped in, Kanga wouldn't know the difference because Piglet is a very small animal. 5. Like Roo. 6. But Kango would have to be looking the other way first, so as not to see Piglet jumping in. Point seven, C point two. Point eight, another tragic thought. But if Pooh was talking to her very excitedly, she might look the other way for a moment. 
Point nine, and then I could run away with Rue. Point ten, quickly. As opposed to all those times when you run away slowly, which are entirely different things, I'm sure. Point eleven, and Kanga wouldn't discover the difference until afterward. I think this kangaroo heist might not work the way they're hoping. Well, Rabbit read this out proudly, and for a little while after he had read it, nobody said anything. And then Piglet, who had been opening and shutting his mouth without making any noise, managed to say very huskily, And... and afterward? How do you mean? When Kanga does discover the difference? Well, then we all say, aha! Uh -huh. All three of us. Yes. Oh. Why, what's the trouble, Piglet? Uh, nothing. As long as we all three say it, as long as we all three say it, said Piglet, I don't mind, but I shouldn't care to say aha uh -huh by myself. It wouldn't sound nearly so well. By the way, you are quite sure you what you read about uh, the winter months? The winter months? Yes, being only fierce in the winter months. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. Well, Pooh, you see what you have to do? No, said Pooh Bear, not yet. What do I do? Well, you just have to talk very hard to Kanga so she doesn't notice anything. Oh, what about? Anything you like. Treat it as a just chatting stream. You mean like telling her there is a bit of poetry or something? And that's it. Splendid. Now come along. So they all went out to look for Kanga. Kanga and Roo were spending a quiet afternoon in a sandy part of the forest. Baby Roo was practicing very small jumps in the sand, and falling down mouse holes and climbing out of them. And Kanga was fidgeting about and saying, Just one more jump, dear, and then we must go home. And at that moment, who should come stumping up the hill but Pooh? Good afternoon, Kanga. Good afternoon, Pooh. Look at me jumping, squeaked Roo, and he fell into another mouse hole. Hello, Roo, my little fellow. We were just going home, said Kanga. Good afternoon, Rabbit. Good afternoon, Piglet. Rabbit and Piglet, who had now come up the other side of the hill, said, Good afternoon, and... Hello, Roo. And Roo asked them to look at him jumping, so they stayed and looked. And Kanga looked too. Oh, Kanga, said Pooh, after Rabbit had winked at him twice. Hmm. I'm not sure I'm winking very well. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 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 <laughs> All right, Lexi, I'll get a drink of water. Ugh, it just looks like I have something stuck in my eye. Disappointing. Oh well, one of these days, chat. One of these days, I shall learn how to wink. And then, then it will not make much difference if I wink or not as I go through the story, because it won't delay things. <laughs> but all the same. So. I don't know if you are interested in poetry at all. <laughs> Hello, pretty kitty. I'm not quite certain what I make of that new nickname that you've decided to give me. But, it's good to have you with us. Thank you for joining in. Hardly at all, said Kanga. Oh, said Pooh. Rude, dear. Just one more jump and then we must go home. 
There was a short silence while Rue fell down another mouse hole. Go on, said Rabbit in a loud whisper behind his paw. Talking of poetry, I made up a little piece as I was coming along. It went like this. Uh, now let me see. Oh, hello, Neko's mom. It's good to see you. Well, I mean, not Cece, but I'm glad you get to watch along with us. I'm delighted that you've chosen to join in. It's been entirely too long since we last hung out. We're going to definitely have to check out that sushi restaurant one of these days, too. I'm holding you to that. <laughs> A fancy, said Kanga. Now, Ru, dear. Yeah. You'll like this bit of poetry, said Rabbit. You'll love it, said Piglet. You must listen very carefully, so as not to miss any of it. Oh, yes said Kanga, but she still looked at Baby Roo. How did it go? Roo gave a little cough and then began. Lines written by a bear of very little brain. On Monday, when the sun is hot, I wonder to myself a lot. Now is it true or is it not that which is which and which is what? On Tuesday, when it hails and snows, the feeling on me Gross and gross, that hardly anybody knows if those are these, or these are those. On Wednesday, when the sky is blue and I have nothing else to do, I sometimes wonder if it's true that who is what and what is who. On Thursday, when it starts to freeze, and hoarfrost twinkles on the trees, how red, very readily one sees that these are whose, but whose are these? On Friday, yes it is, isn't it? Said Kanga, not wanting to hear what happened on Friday. Just one more jump there, Roo, and then we really must be going. Rabbit gave Pooh a hurrying up sort of nudge. Talking of poetry. Have you ever noticed that tree right over there? Where? said Kanga. Now, Ru. Right over there, said Pooh, pointing behind Kanga's back. No. Now jump in, Ru, dear, and we'll go home. You ought to look at that tree right over there. You ought to look at that tree right over there, said Rabbit. Uh, shall I lift you in, Ru? And he picked up Ru in his paws. I can see a bird in it from here. Or is it a fish? You ought to see that bird from here, unless it's a fish. It isn't a fish, it's a bird, said Piglet. And so it is. Is it a starling or a blackbird? Oh, that's the whole question. Is it a blackbird or a starling? And then at last, Kanga did turn her head to look. And the moment that her head was turned, Piglet said in a loud voice, In you go, Roo! And in jumped Piglet into Kanga's pocket and off scampered Rabbit with Roo in his paws, as fast as he could. Why, where is the rabbit? said Kanga, turning round again. Are you all right, Roo, dear? Piglet made a squeaky Roo noise from the bottom of Kanga's pocket. A rabbit had to go away, said Pooh. I think he thought of something he had to go and see about suddenly. And Piglet? I think Piglet thought of something at the same time. Suddenly. Indeed, it's Kanga and Rue tonight, Caffrey. Thank you for joining in. Well, we must be getting home, said Kanga. Goodbye, Pooh. And in three large jumps, she was gone. Who looked after her as she went? I would like to jump like that, he thought. Some can, and some can't. That's how it is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're most welcome, Caffrey. I don't know what to think of you with that particular accent on my name, though. <laughs> But there were moments when Piglet would have liked it if Kanga couldn't 
Often, when he had a long walk home through the forest, he had wished that he were a bird. But now he thought jerkily to himself at the bottom of Kanga's pocket, If this is flying, I shall never really take to it! And as he went up in the air and said, Ooh! And as he came down and said, Ow! And as he was saying, Ooh! Ow! Ooh! Ow! Ooh! Ow! All the way to Kanga's house. Of course, as soon as Kanga unbuttoned her pocket, she saw what had happened. Just for a moment, she thought she was frightened, and then she knew she wasn't, for she felt quite sure that Christopher Robin would never let any harm happen to Rue. So she said to herself, If they're having a joke with me, I will have a joke with them. Now then, Rue, dear, she said as she took Piglet out of her pocket, it is bedtime. Aha! said Piglet, as well as he could after his terrifying journey. But it wasn't a very good aha, and Kanga didn't seem to understand what it meant. A bad first, said Kanga in a cheerful voice. <laughs> well, an aromatic way is certainly one way to describe yourself, Kefri. Aha! Uh -huh, said Piglet again looking round anxiously for the others, but the others weren't there. Rabbit was playing with Baby Roo in his own house and feeling more fond of him every minute, and Pooh, who had decided to be a Kanga, was still standing at the sandy place on top of the forest, practicing jumps. Those big old Pooh jumps. I am not at all sure, said Kanga in a thoughtful voice, that it wouldn't be a good idea to have a cold bath this evening. Would you like that, Rue, dear? Piglet, who had never really been fond of baths, shuddered a long, indignant shudder, and said in as brave a voice as he could, oh, Kanga, I see that the time has come to speak plainly. A oh, funny little Rue, said Kanga as she got the bath water ready. I am not Rue. I am Piglet. Yes, dear. And imitating Piglet's voice, too. So clever of him. Hello, Legal. It's good to see you. Thank you for dropping in. Oh, Legal, don't miss me. We know you have better aim than that. <laughs> but thank you for returning, and it's good to see you again. So clever of him, she went on as she took a large bar of yellow soap out of the cupboard. What will he be doing next? <laughs> Can't you see? Haven't you got eyes? Look at me! I am looking at you, Rue, dear. And you know what I told you yesterday about making faces. If you go on making faces like Piglet, you will grow up to look like Piglet. And then think how sorry you will be. Now into the bath and don't let me have to speak to you about it again. Before he knew where he was, Piglet was in the bath and Kanga was scrubbing him firmly with a large lathery flannel. Oh, let me out. I'm Piglet. Oh, don't open your mouth here or the soap goes in, said Kanga. There, what did I tell you? You, 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 you did it on purpose! Thank you for the hugs, Legal. I appreciate them. As soon as Piglet could speak again, he uttered this, and then accidentally had another mouthful of lathery flannel. That's right, dear. Don't say anything, said Kanga, and in another minute Piglet was out of the bath and being rubbed dry with a towel. Now said Kanga. There is your medicine and then bed. Oh, but what medicine? To make you grow big and strong, dear. You don't want to grow up small and weak like the piglet, do you? Well then... At that moment, there was a knock on the door. Come in, said Kanga, and in came Christopher Robin. Christopher Robin, Christopher Robin, cried Piglet. Tell Kanga who I am. She keeps saying I'm Rue. I'm not Rue, am I? 
Christopher Robin looked at him very carefully and shook his head. You can't be Rue, because I've just seen Rue playing in Rabbit's house. Well, fancy that. Fancy my making a mistake like that. There you are. I told you so. I'm Piglet. Christopher Robin shook his head again. Oh, you're not Piglet. I know Piglet well, and he's quite a different color. Piglet began to say this was because he had just had a bath, and then he thought perhaps he wouldn't say that. As he opened his mouth to say something else, Kanga slipped a medicine spoon in and then patted him on the back and told him it was really quite a nice taste when you got used to it. I knew it wasn't Piglet. I wonder who it can be. <sighs> oh, Legal, those are quite the cute little emotes there. I don't necessarily know what they mean, but I'm glad that you wanted to share them with me. Perhaps it is some relation of Pooh's, said Christopher Robin. What about a nephew or an uncle or something? Hanga agreed that this was probably what it was, and said that they would have to call it by some name. I shall call it Pootel, said Christopher Robin. Henry Pootel for short. And just when it was decided, Henry Pootel wriggled out of Kanga's arms and jumped to the ground. To his great joy, Christopher Robin had left the door open. Never had Henry Pootel Piglet run so fast as he ran then, and he didn't stop running until he had got quite close to his house. But when he was a hundred yards away, he stopped running and rolled the rest of the way home, so at his, as to get his nice, comfortable color again. So Kanga and Rue stayed in the forest, and every Tuesday, Rue spent the day with his great friend Rabbit, and every Tuesday, Kanga spent the day with her great friend Pooh, teaching him to jump. And every Tuesday, Piglet spent all day with his great friend Christopher Robin. So they were all happy again. That is a lovely ending to a chapter about trying to kidnap somebody's child out from under them in order to get rid of them. Oh my. <laughs> Chapter 8, in which Christopher Robin leads an expedition to the North Pole. Well, that sounds like a rather cool journey. <laughs> Hello, Link. It's good to see you. Thank you for dropping in. One fine day, Pooh had stumped up to the top of the forest to see if his friend Christopher Robin was interested in bears at all. At breakfast that morning, a simple meal of marmalade spread lightly over honeycomb or two, he had suddenly thought of a new song. It began like this. Sing ho for the life of a bear. When he had got as far as this, he scratched his head and thought to himself, That's a very good start for a song, but what about a second line? He tried singing... Oh, two or three times, but it didn't seem to help. Perhaps it would be better if I sang hi for the life of a bear. So he sang it, but it wasn't at all. Very well, then. I shall sing the first line twice. And perhaps if I sing it very quickly, I shall find myself singing the third and fourth lines before I have time to think of them, and that will be a good song. Is it bad that Pooh's songwriting style is similar to my own? <laughs> I, I've done this with parodies a few times, and, uh, well. Sing ho for the life of a bear, sing ho for the life of a bear. I don't much mind if it rains or snows, cause I've got a lot of honey on my nice new nose. I don't much care if it snows or thaws, cause I've got a lot of honey on my nice clean paws. Sing ho for a bear, sing ho for a poo. 
And I'll have a little something in an hour or two. He was so pleased with this song that he sang it all the way to the top of the forest. And if I go on singing it much longer, he thought, it will be time for the little something and then the last line won't be true. So he turned it to a hum instead. Oh, Legal, thank you for the headpads. It's delightful to have our resident bear listening in while we talk about someone saying ho for the life of a bear. <laughs> Christopher Robin was sitting outside his door, putting on his big boots. As soon as he saw the big boots, Pooh knew that an adventure was going to happen, and he brushed the honey off his nose with the back of his paw and spruced himself up as well as he could, so as to look ready for anything. Good morning, Christopher Robin, he called out. Hello, Pooh Bear. I can't get this boot on. That's bad. Do you think you could very kindly lean against me? Because I keep pulling so hard that I fall over backward. <laughs> Legal, I'm delighted to hear that the life of a bear is absolutely marvelous. You absolutely deserve a marvelous life. I'm doing well today, Link. Thank you for asking. How are you doing today? Hope you've had a good time with things. Who sat down, dug his feet into the ground, and pushed hard against Christopher Robin's back. And Christopher Robin pushed hard against his, and pulled and pulled at his boots until he had got it on. Oh, welcome home from work, Link. I'm glad you've decided to join me as, you know, you get home here. Um, make sure that you've, uh, Got some food and some nice comfy time, because this is a good story to relax to, I think. <laughs> and that's that, said Pooh. What do we do next? We are all going on an expedition, said Christopher Robin, as he got up and brushed himself. Oh, thank you, Pooh. Going on an expedition? I don't think I've been in one of those. Where are we going to on this expedition? <laughs> expedition, silly old bear. It's got an X in it. Oh, said Pooh. But he didn't, really. We're going to discover the North Pole. Oh, uh, what is the North Pole? It's just a thing you discover said Christopher Robin carelessly, not being quite sure himself. Oh, I see. Are bears any good at discovering it? Of course they are. And Rabbit and Kanga and all of you, it's an expedition. That's what an expedition means. A long line of everybody. You'd better tell the others to get ready while I see if my gun's all right. And then we must all bring provisions. Bring what? At things to eat. Oh, said Pooh happily. I thought you said provisions. I'll go and tell them. And he stumped off. The first person he met was Rabbit. Oh, <laughs> glad you're enjoying, Cuffrey. Hello, Rabbit. Is that you? Let's pretend it isn't and see what happens. Oh, I've got a message for you. I'll give it to him. We're all going on an expedition with Christopher Robin. And what is it when we're on it? A sort of boat, I think. Oh, that sort. Uh, yes. And we're going to discover a pole. Or something. Or was it a mole? Anyhow, we're going to discover it. Uh, we are, are we? Yes, and we've got to bring pro uh, pro things to eat with us, in case we want to eat them. Now I'm going to down to Piglet's. Tell Kanga, will you? He left Rabbit and hurried down to Piglet's house. The Piglet was sitting on the ground at the door of his house, blowing happily at a dandelion. 
and wondering whether it would be this year, next year, or sometime, or never. He had just discovered that it would be never and was trying to remember what it was and hoping it wasn't anything nice when Pooh came up. Oh, look at the dandelion blowing in the breeze. A lazy summer day with nothing to do and all the time in the world to do it again. What delight. Oh, Piglet, said Pooh excitedly. We're going on an expedition, all of us with things to eat, to discover something. Uh, to discover what? Oh, just something. Nothing fierce. Christopher Robin didn't say anything about fierce. He just said it had an X. It isn't their necks, I mind, said Piglet earnestly. It's their teeth. But if Christopher Robin is coming, I don't mind anything. In a little while, they were already at the top of the forest, and the exp expedition started. First came Christopher Robin and Rabbit, then Piglet and Pooh, then Kanga, with Rue in her pocket and Owl, then Eeyore, and at the end of the long line, all Rabbit's friends and relations. I didn't ask them, Rabbit explained carelessly. They just came. They always do. They can march at the end after Eeyore. What I say, said Eeyore, is that it's unsettling. I didn't want to come on this expo, what Pooh said. I only came to oblige, but here I am. Oh, and here's Easily Bored. Thank you for lurking with us today, Easy Bean. And if I am the end of the expo, what we're talking about, then let me be the end. But if every time I want to sit down for a little rest, I have to brush away half a dozen of Rabbit's smaller friends and relations first, then this isn't an expo, whatever it is, at all. It's simply a confused noise. Now that's what I say. Hmm, seems like quite the ordeal. I see what Owl means. Er, what Eeyore means, said Owl. If you ask me, I'm not asking anyone. I'm just telling everybody we can look for the North Pole where we can play. Here we go, gathering nuts and may. With the end part of an ant's nest. It's all the same to me. Come on! Called out Christopher Robin. Come on! Come on! Come on! We're starting. I must go. And Rabbit hurried off to the front of the expedition with Christopher Robin. All right, everyone. We're going, only don't blame me. So off they all went to discover the pole, and as they walked, they chattered to each other of this and that, all except Pooh, who was making up a song. This is the first verse, he said to Piglet when he was ready with it. A oh, first verse of what? My song. What song? This one. Which one? Well, if you listen, Piglet, you'll hear it. How do you know I'm not listening? Who couldn't answer that one? So he began to sing. They all went off to discover the pole, Owl and Piglet and Rabbit and all. It's a thing you discover, as I've been told, by Owl and Piglet and Rabbit and all. 
Eeyore, Christopher, Robin, and Pooh, and Rabbit's relations all went to. And where the poor was, none of them knew. Sing hey for Owl and Rabbit and all. Hush, said Christopher Robin, turning round to Pooh. We're just coming to a dangerous place. Hush, said Pooh, turning round quickly to Piglet. Hush, said Piglet to Kanga. Hush, said Kanga to Owl, while Roo said, Hush, hush, several times to himself, very quietly. Hush, said Owl to Eeyore. Hush, said Eeyore in a terrible voice to all Rabbit's friends and relations. And they said hastily down the line until it got to the last one of them all. And the last and smallest friend and relation was so upset to find that the whole exportation was saying hush to him that he buried his head downward in a crack in the ground and stayed there for two days until the danger was over. And then went home in a great hurry and lived quietly with his aunt ever afterward. His name was Alexander Beetle. I don't think I've heard of an Alexander Beetle. And I suspect that might be the very intent of Alexander Beetle in the first place. They had come to a stream which twisted and tumbled between high rocky banks, and Christopher Robin saw at once how dangerous it was. It's just the place for an ambush. Oh, what sort of bush? whispered Pooh to Piglet. Is it like a gorse bush? My dear Pooh, don't you know what an ambush is? Owl, whose whisper was a perfectly private whisper and there was no need. An ambush is a sort of surprise. So is the gorse bush sometimes. An, an ambush, as I was about to explain to Pooh, is a sort of surprise. If people jump out at you and sudden yell suddenly, that's an ambush. <laughs> I'm glad to hear I'm extremely comfy for you, Legal. It's an ambush, Pooh, when people jump at you suddenly, explained Piglet. <laughs> oh no, I've been ambushed with a hug attack by Legal. Oh, whatever am I to do other than hug the deer bear back? Thank you for the lovely ambush, Legal. Who, who now knew what an ambush was, said that a gorse bush had sprung him suddenly one day when he fell off a tree, and he had taken six days to get all the prickles out of himself. We are not talking about gorse bushes, said Owl a little crossly. I am, said Pooh. Oh, Caffrey, thank you for the ambush hug. <laughs> oh dear, I'm being ambushed by all sorts of wonderful people tonight. <laughs> oh, thank you all. They were climbing very cautiously up the stream now, going from rock to rock. And after they had gone a little way, they came to a place where the banks widened out at each side, so that each side of the water was the... Uh, there was a lovely strip of grass on which they could sit down and rest. As soon as he saw this, Christopher Robin called out, HALT! And they all sat down and rested. I think that we ought to eat all our provisions now, so we shan't have so much to carry. Eat all our what? All that we've brought, said Piglet, getting to work. That's a good idea! said Pooh, and he got to work too. Have you all got something? asked Christopher Robin with his mouth full. All except me, as usual, said Eeyore. He looked round at them in his melancholy way. I suppose none of you are sitting on a thistle by any chance. I believe I... I believe I am, 
said Poot. Oh. That is not at all how I meant to do that. I believe that I am, said Poot. Ow! He got up and looked behind him. Yes, I was. I thought so. Thank you, Pooh. If you've quite finished with it. Eeyore moved across to Pooh's place and began to eat. That looks like a very unpleasant place to sit, and I can't help wondering why Pooh sat there in the first place, other than he is, in fact, a bear of very little brain. It won't do them any good, you know, sitting on them. He went on as he looked up, munching. Takes all the life out of them. Remember that another time, all of you. A little consideration, a little thought for others makes all the difference. As soon as he had finished his lunch, Christopher Robin whispered to Rabbit, and Rabbit said, Yes, yes, of course. And they walked a little way up the stream together. I didn't want the others to hear, said Christopher Robin. Quite so, said Rabbit, looking important. It's, I wondered, it's only, Rabbit, I suppose you don't know. What does the North Pole look like? Well, now you're asking me. I did know once, only I've sort of forgotten, said Christopher Robin carelessly. It's a funny thing, but I've sort of forgotten too. Although I did know once. I suppose it's just a pole stuck in the ground? Hmm, sure to be a pole because of calling it a pole. And if it's a pole, well, I should think it would be sticking in the ground, shouldn't you? Because there'd be nowhere else to stick it. Yes, that's what I thought. The only thing is, where is it sticking? Well, that's what we're looking for. They went back to the others. Piglet was lying on his back, sleeping peacefully. Roo was washing his face and paws in the stream, while Kanga explained to everybody proudly that this was the first time he had ever washed his face... Uh... Roo had ever washed his face himself, and Owl was telling Kanga an interesting anecdote full of long words like encyclopedia and rhododendron, to which Kanga wasn't listening. Pandad 54 noodles? Legal? Are you giving me a password? <laughs> I didn't even think I'd done anything to earn a password. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear. Alright. I suppose I shall have to update my password count here. Let's see. <laughs> well, thank you for the compliments on my talents legal <laughs> and telling me not to get full of myself Kefri, you're not wrong I do need to remain humble but thank you for the reminder oh dear Piglet was lying on his back sleeping peacefully Rue was washing his face and paws in the stream and we've already read this line I don't hold with all this washing, grumbled Eeyore. This modern behind-the-ears nonsense. What do you think, Pooh? Well, said Pooh, I think. We shall never know what Pooh thought, for there came a sudden squeak from Roo, a splash, and a loud cry of alarm from Kanga. So much for washing, said Eeyore. Roo's fallen in, said Rabbit, and he and Christopher Robin came rushing down to the rescue.
Oh, poor Legal's still trying to get that emote to... Well, I suppose I shouldn't count that as a password then. <laughs> Look at me swimming! Squeaked Rue from the middle of the pool, and was hurried down a waterfall into the next pool. Are you all right, Rue, dear? Called Kanga anxiously. <laughs> Caffrey, why are you worried about the exact value that the password count is at? All right, all right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> Alright, the password count is back down to zero for those of you who are keeping track at home. <laughs> yes, said Rue. Look at me sweet! And down he went over the next waterfall into another pool. Everybody was doing something to help. Piglet. Wide awake suddenly, was jumping up and down and making Ooh, I say noises. Owl was explaining that in case of sudden and temporary immersion, the important thing was to keep your head above water. Kanga was jumping along the bank saying, Are you sure you're all right, dear Roo dear? To which Roo, from whatever pool he was in at the moment, was answering, Look at me swimming. Eeyore had turned around and his hung his tail over the first pool into which Rue fell, and his back to the accident was grumbling quietly to himself, saying, All this washing, I catch on to my tail, little Rue, and you'll be all right. And Christopher, Robin, and Rabbit came hurrying past Eeyore, and were calling out to the others in front of them. All right, Rue, I'm coming, called Christopher Robin. Get something across the stream lower down, some of you fellows, called Rabbit. But Pooh was getting something. Two pools below Roo, he was standing with long pole in his paws, and Kanga came up and took one end of it, and between them they held it across the lower part of the pool, and Roo, still bubbling proudly, Look at me, swimming! drifted up against it and climbed out. <laughs> Oh my goodness, all of these different jumpies in chat all of a sudden. <laughs> well, I hope your sister enjoys the narration, Legal. And thank you for sharing the story with her. Did you see me swimming? Squeaked Rue excitedly, while Kanga scolded him and rubbed him down. Oh, did you see me swimming? That's called swimming, what I was doing! Rabbit, did you see what I was doing? Swimming! Hello, Pigman. I say, Piglet, what do you think I was doing? Swimming! Christopher Robin, did you see me? But Christopher Robin wasn't listening. He was looking at Pooh. Ooh, where did you find that pole? I just found it. I thought it would be useful. I just picked it up, said Pooh as he looked at the pole in his hands. Ooh, the expedition is over. You have found the North Pole! Oh! Eeyore was sitting with his tail in the water when they all got back to him. Oh, Rue, to be quick, somebody. My tail's getting cold. I don't want to mention it, but just mention it. I don't want to complain, but there it is. My tail's cold. Here I am, squeaked Rue. Oh, there you are. Did you see me swimming? Eeyore took his tail out of the water and swished it from side to side. As I expected. Lost all feeling. Numbed it. That's what it's done. Numbed it. Well, as nobody, as nobody minds, I suppose it's all right. World Eeyore, I'll dry it for you, said Christopher Robin, and he took out his handkerchief and rubbed it up. Thank you, Christopher Robin. 
the only one who seems to understand about tales. They don't think that's what the matter is with these others. They have no imagination. A tale isn't a tale to them. It's just some extra bit at the back. Never mind, Eeyore, said Christopher Robin, rubbing his hardest. Is that better? It's feeling more like a tale, perhaps. Belongs again, if you know what I mean. Hello, Eeyore, said Pooh, coming back up to them with his pole. Hello, Pooh. Thank you for asking, but I shall be able to use it again in a day or two. They used what? What we are talking about. I wasn't talking about anything, said Pooh, looking puzzled. Uh, oh, well, please thank your sister for the compliment, Legal. That's very polite of her. <laughs> I'd be delighted to do more voice acting beyond streams, but I haven't got a project that I'm assigned to at present with it, so I suppose I'll simply have to keep looking, and in the meanwhile, keep reading the story. My mistake again. I thought you were saying how sorry you were about my tale, being all numb, and could you do anything to help? No, that wasn't me, he said. Who thought for a little while and then suggested helpfully, Perhaps it was somebody else. Well, thank him for me when you see him. Who looked anxiously at Christopher Robin. Who's found the North Pole? Isn't that lovely? Who looked modestly down. Is that it? Yes. Is that what we were looking for? Uh, yes. Oh, said Eeyore. Well, anyhow, it didn't rain, he said. They stuck the pole in the ground, and Christopher Robin tied a message on it. North Pole, discovered by Pooh. Who found it? Hello, Dark Bogart. It's good to see you. Glad you dropped in. It's been a hot minute. How are you doing there? Oh, I need to get in the cute box. Okay, give me just a moment here. And uh, let's see what we can do about pulling up a cute box. There it is. I think the cute box is here. Um... Apparently, I am in front of the cute box now. Uh, let's see here. Nope, that is not the direction I wanted to move the cute box. Hmm. I have no idea how to make this work, so we're going to keep playing with it until it does. Um, let's see here. We'll just have that face the camera. Or, no, okay. And pull it up just a little bit. And there we are. I do believe.
I believe I'm in a cute box now. Um, yeah. I don't know. You'll have to tell me in chat if it's sufficiently cute boxed. Well, dark art, but or dark bug art, you actually are a very talented artist. In fact, since you're here, so dark bug art is actually a talented uh, comic artist and uh, has been doing their own writing on some things here as well. So, um, if you get a chance, I do recommend that you give dark bug art a follow. Um, it, I don't see them online all the time, but, I mean, I'm not online all the time either, so I can hardly blame anyone for that. Um, I'm glad you're still happy with the cute box, Legal. And, uh, yes, Le Legal is actually the reason we have a cute box, so we'll, we'll leave that uh, cute box in place for just a little bit here. <laughs> you know, Dark Bug Art, that's totally fine keeping a schedule. I'm not particularly good at it, so I've got no room to talk whatsoever. <laughs> at any rate... Mm -hmm. Then they all went home again, and I think, but I'm not quite sure, that Rue had got a hot bath and went straight to bed. But Pooh went back to his own house, and feeling very proud of himself for what he had done, had a little something to revive himself. And now we've come to chapter 9, in which Piglet is surrounded by water. That sounds quite terrifying for such a small animal, as the Piglet is. Hmm. Hmm. It rained, and it rained, and it rained. Piglet told himself that never in all his life, and he was goodness knows how old, three was it, or four, never had he seen so much rain. Days, and days, and days. If only, he thought as he looked out of the window, I had been in Pooh's house, or Christopher Robin's house, or Rabbit's house when it began to rain. Then I should have company all this time, instead of being here all alone, with nothing to do except wonder when it will stop. And he imagined himself with Pooh, saying, Did you ever see such rain, Pooh? And Pooh saying, Isn't it awful, Piglet? <laughs> yes, Legal, I am hydrating, but if you want me to take another sip, I certainly can. <clears throat> I have almost burned through my entire glass here, so that's pretty nice. In fact, I might just finish it off real quick. <clears throat> that is very much tap water. And Piglet would be saying, I wonder how it is over Christopher Robin's way. And Pooh would say, I should think poor old Rabbit is about flooded out by this time. It would have been jolly to talk like this. And really, it wasn't so much good having anything exciting like floods if you couldn't share them with somebody. Excuse me. Oh? Oh, Joe's <laughs> just got in from ousting Kira, I suppose. Ah, uh, well, Joes, uh, congratulations on taking them down, but I I'm rather fond of Kira and a little sad to hear that you've, you know, overthrown their kingdom. I mean, I, I suppose that that's what you needed to do, but, um, well, things are what they are, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting bonks by Kefri. 
Oh, I love it. For it was rather exciting. The little dry ditches in which Piglet had nosed about so often had become streams. The little streams across which he had splashed were rivers, and the river, between whose steep banks they had played so happily, had sprawled out over its own bed and was taking up so much room everywhere that Piglet was beginning to wonder whether it would all be coming into his bed soon. <laughs> Oh, Kefri was in a rival faction to Joe's. Huh. Well, it's good to know that Joe's is able to politically outmaneuver Kefri. It's a little anxious, he said to himself, to be a very small animal surrounded entirely by water. Oh, Christopher Robin and Pooh could escape by climbing trees, and Kanga could escape by jumping, and Rabbit could escape by burrowing, and Owl by flying, and Eeyore could escape by... Mm -hmm, by making loud noise until rescued. And here I am, surrounded by water, and I can't do anything! It went on raining, and every day the water got a little higher until now it was nearly up to Piglet's window, and he still hadn't done anything. Well, that's a little bit distressing. There's Pooh, he thought to himself. Pooh hasn't much brain, but he never comes to any harm. He does silly things and they turn out all right. And there's Owl. Owl hasn't exactly got brain, but he knows things. He would know the right thing to do when surrounded by water. And there's Rabbit. He hasn't learned in books, but he can always think of a clever plan. And there's Kanga. She isn't clever, Kanga, but she wouldn't be so anxious about... R anxious about Rue that she would do a good thing to do without thinking about it. And there's Eeyore, and Eeyore is so miserable anyhow that he wouldn't mind this, but I wonder what Christopher Robin would do. And it's very true. Kefri probably also belongs in the cute box, but I don't have a Kefri picture on hand. Sorry, Chad. I would love to show you, though. Hmm. Yeah. Kefri, are you worried about being shown on stream, or are you worried about being called cute? <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Then suddenly, he remembered a story in which Christopher Robin had told him about a man on a desert island who had written something in a bottle and thrown it into the sea. And Piglet thought that if he wrote something in a bottle and threw it in the water, perhaps someone would come and rescue him. He left the window and began to search his house, all of it that wasn't underwater, and at last he found a pencil and a small piece of dry paper and a bottle with a cork to it, and he wrote on one side of the hel paper, Help! Piglet! Me! And on the other side, It's me, Piglet! Help! Help! All right, Lexi, have a good time with your stream. Thank you very much for lurking. It's good to have you with us for the time that you've chosen to be here. And I know that uh, Lexi's stream is something that is uh, essentially of particular interest tonight. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, rather unfortunately worded and unfortunately decided laws uh, throughout the United States in recent months and years. And Lexi is just going to be talking about some of these things and supporting the Trevor Project. So if you get a chance, I do recommend that you take a look at uh, what she's got going on tonight with Road to Dusk and Night Haze. Uh, all three of them are people that I've streamed with in the past and are particularly uh, considerate individuals. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say on the subject. I think it's... Uh, it's a very important one to talk about, and it's an important one that if you can take some action on, you absolutely should. Then he put the paper in the bottle, and he corked the bottle up as tightly as he could, and he leant out of the window as far as he could lean, without falling in, and he threw the bottle as far as he could throw. Splash! 
and in a little while it bobbed up again on the water, and he watched it floating slowly away in the distance, until his eyes ached with looking. And sometimes he thought it was a little bottle, and sometimes he thought it was just a ripple on the water which he was following. And then suddenly he knew that he would never see it again, and that he had done all he could to save himself. Thank you. But, you know, you all deserve it. I'm glad you've all joined me, and I hope that this is something that everyone is as concerned about as I am, because it it matters. These are people's lives that we're talking about. And, you know, we throw our little bottles out the window and hope somebody finds Piglet in time to save us. So now, he thought, somebody else will have to do something and I hope they will do it soon. Because if they don't, I shall have to swim and I can't. So I hope they do it soon. And he gave a very long sigh and said that he wished who were here. It's so much more friendly with two. When the rain began, who was asleep? It rained, and it rained, and it rained, and he slept, and he slept, and he slept. He had had a tiring day. You remember how he discovered the North Pole? Well, he was so proud of this that he asked Christopher Robin if there was any other poles such as a bare, video very little brain might discover. Well, there's the South Pole. I expect there's an East and West Pole, but people don't like talking about them. Who was very excited when he heard this, and suggested that they should have an expedition to the discover the East Pole. But Christopher Robin had thought of something else to do with Kanga, so Pooh went out to discover the East Pole by himself. Whether he discovered it or not, I forget. But he was so tired when he got home that in the very middle of his supper after he had been eating for little more than half an hour, he fell fast asleep in his chair and slept and slept. Then suddenly he was dreaming. He was at the East Pole, and it was a very cold pole with the coldest sort of snow and ice all over it. He had found a beehive to sleep in, but there wasn't room for his legs, so he had left them outside. And wild woozles, such as inhabit the East Pole, came and nibbled all the fur off his legs to make nests for their young. And more they nibbled, the colder his legs got until suddenly he woke up with an OH! And all around, and there he was, sitting in his chair with his feet in the water and water all around him. He splashed to his door and looked out. This is serious, said Pooh. I must have an escape. So he took his largest pot of honey and escaped with it into the broad branch of his tree, well above the water. And then he climbed down again and escaped with another pot. And when the whole escape was finished, there was Pooh sitting on his branch, dangling his legs there, and beside him were ten pots of honey. Congratulations on getting a job interview, Joes. I'm really glad to hear it. That's awesome. Kefri, as far as what kind of a dream it is, it's the kind of dream that is had by a bear of very little brain. Two days later, there was Pooh sitting on his branch, dangling his legs, and there beside him were four pots of honey. Three days later, there was Pooh, sitting on his branch, dangling his legs, and there beside him was one pot of honey. Four days later, there was Pooh, and it was on the morning of the fourth day that Piglet's bottle came floating past him with the one loud cry of, HONEY! Pooh plunged into the water, seized the bottle, and struggled to get back to his tree again. Oh, bother, said Pooh as he opened it. All that wet was for nothing. What's that bit of paper doing? He took it out and looked at it. It's a message, he said to himself. That's what it is. And that letter is a B. And so is that. And so is that. And P means poo. So it's a very important message to me. And I can't read it myself. I must find Christopher Robin or Owl or Piglet 
one of those clever readers who can read things, and they will tell me what this message means. Only I can't swim. Bother. Then he had an idea, and I think that for a bear of very little brain, it was a good idea. He said to himself, If a bottle can float, then a jar can float. And if a jar floats, I can sit on the top of it, if it's a very big jar. Oh. Well, I do hope that Dollar Tree treats you properly, Joes. But congratulations all the same on getting the interview. I know it's been a very big source of stress for you lately. It's always unpleasant to be adrift in your jar of honey. So he took his biggest jar and corked it up. All boats have got to have a name. So I shall call mine the Floating Bear. And with these words, he dropped his boat into the water and jumped in after it. For a little while, Pooh and the Floating Bear were uncertain as to which of them was meant to be on the top. But after trying one or two different positions, they settled with the Floating Bear underneath, and Pooh triumphantly astride it, paddling vigorously with his feet. Christopher Robin lived at the top of the very top of the forest. It rained and it rained and it rained, but the water couldn't come up to his house. It was rather jolly to look down into the valley and see the water all around him, but it rained so hard that he stayed indoors most of the time and thought about things. Every morning he went out with his umbrella and put a stick in the place where the water line came up to, and every next morning he went out and couldn't see his stick anymore. So he put another stick in the place where the water came up to, and then he walked home again. And each morning he had a shorter and shorter walk than he had had the morning before. On the morning of the fifth day, he saw the water all around him, and knew that for the first time in his life, he was on a real island, which was very exciting. Since, as we all know, you know, Great Britain isn't a real island, it's a pretend island, along with all those other fake islands. Mm. It was on this morning that Owl came flying over the water to say, How do you do? to his friend, Christopher Robin. <laughs> Talk about it shows. <laughs> oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> I say, Owl, isn't this fun? I'm on an island. The atmospheric conditions have been very unfavorable lately. The what? It has been raining. Yes, it has. The flood level has reached an unprecedented height. The who? There's a lot of water about. Yes. There is. However, the prospects are rapidly becoming more favorable. At any moment... Have you seen Pooh? Uh, no. At any moment... I hope Pooh is alright. I've been wondering about him. I expect Piglet's with him. Do you think they're alright, Owl? I expect so. You see, at any moment... Do you go and see Owl? Because Pooh hasn't got very much brain, and he might do something silly. And I do love him so, Owl. Do you see, Owl? That's all right. I'll go back directly. And he flew off. In a little while, he was back again. Who isn't there? Not there. Has been there? He's been sitting on a branch of his tree outside his house with nine pots of honey. But he isn't there now. Oh, Pooh, where are you? Here I am, said a growly voice behind him. Pooh! They rushed into each other's arms. How did you get here, Pooh? asked Christopher Robin when he was ready to talk again. On my boat. 
I had a very important message sent me in a bottle and owing to having got some water in my eyes, I couldn't read it. So I brought it to you. On my boat. <laughs> and you're absolutely adorable too, Legal, but thank you. With these proud words, he gave Christopher and Robin the message. But it's from Piglet, cried Christopher Robin when he had read it. Isn't there anything about Pooh in it? Asked the bear, looking over his shoulder. Christopher Robin read the message aloud. Oh, are those peas piglets? I thought they were poos. We must rescue him at once. I thought he was with you. Pooh, Owl, could you res Owl, could you rescue him on your back? I don't think so, said Owl after a grave thought. It is doubtful the necessary dorsal muscles. Then I, would you fly to him at once and say that a rescue is coming? And Pooh and I will think of a rescue and come as quick as ever we can. Oh, don't talk, Owl. Go on quick. And think, still think of something to say. Owl flew off. <laughs> mm, all right. You are very cute, Legal. We'll stick with cute for now if that's where you're comfortable. Now then, Pooh, where's your boat? I ought to say, explained Pooh as they walked down to the shore of the island, that it isn't just an ordinary sort of boat. Sometimes it's a boat, and sometimes it's more of an accident. It all depends. <laughs> sometimes it's a boat, and sometimes it's an accident. I... Perhaps it's just me, but that really does seem like just so many kinds of mood. Some days you're the boat, some days you're the accident. What does it depend on? On whether I'm on the top of it or underneath it. Oh, well, where is it? There! said Pooh, pointing proudly to the floating bear. It wasn't what Christopher Robin expected, and the more he looked at it, the more he thought what a brave and clever bear Pooh was. And the more Christopher Robin thought this, the more Pooh looked modestly down at his nose and tried to pretend he wasn't. But it's too small for two of us. Three of us with Piglet. That makes it smaller still. Oh, Pooh Bear, what shall we do? And this is where... Then this bear, Pooh Bear, Winnie the Pooh, F.O.P., Friend of Piglets, R.C., Rabbit's Companion, P.D., Pole Discoverer, E.C., and T.F., Eeyore's Comforter and Tail Finder. In fact, Pooh himself said something so clever that Christopher Robin could only look at him with his mouth open and eyes staring, wondering if this was really the bear of very little brain whom he had known and loved for so long. We might go in your umbrella. Eh? We might go in your umbrella. Eh? We might go in your umbrella. Hello, Lucy Deary. How are you? Thank you for joining us tonight. We've got some lovely bits of Winnie the Pooh from the Hundred Acre Wood. There's been a big flood, and it's time to rescue Piglet. For suddenly, Christopher Robin saw that they might. He opened his umbrella and put it downward in the water. It floated, but wobbled. Who got in? He was just beginning to say that it was all right now when he found it wasn't. So after a short drink, which he didn't really want, he waded back to Christopher Robin. They both got in together, and the umbrella wobbled no longer. Thank you for the hugs, Lucy. I really appreciate them. A big hug for you, too. Oh, that's wonderful. I like hugs. 
I shall call this boot boat the Brain of Pooh, said Christopher Robin. The Brain of Pooh set sail forthwith in a southwesterly direction, revolving gracefully. You can imagine Piglet's joy when at last the ship came in sight of him. In after years, he liked to think that he had been very great danger during the terrible flood, but the only danger he had really been in was the last half hour of his imprisonment when Owl, who had just flown up, sat on the branch of his tree to comfort him and told him a very long story about an aunt who had once laid a seagull's egg by mistake, and the story went on and on and rather like this sentence until Piglet, who was listening out of his window without much hope, went to sleep quietly and naturally, slipping slowly out of the window toward the water until he was only hanging on by his toes, at which moment luckily a sudden loud squawk from Owl, which was really part of the story, being... What his aunt said woke the piglet up and just gave him time to jerk himself back into safety and say, Oh, interesting. And did she? When, well, you can imagine his joy when at last he saw the ship. Brain of Pooh, Captain C. Robin, first mate, P. Bear, coming over the sea to rescue him. Christopher Robin and Pooh again. Hello, Bibby Beep. It's good to see you. Uh, Lucy, the password count is what happens when every once in a while somebody just mashes all the keys on their keyboard. Um, this has been known to happen with certain stories or certain voices that I'll use. Uh, people will just decide that they're a bit overwhelmed and they need to let everybody know it as immediately as possible. And on those occasions, uh, it is very common to see just a password appear in chat. And once we have passwords, we keep count of the passwords so that we know that we have had passwords in chat. Uh, Legal was trying to put some emotes in earlier, and I confused the emotes for a password because they did not show up. So, we have our password count up early tonight. Normally, I wait until there's actually been a password in chat. So yes, our password count for tonight currently sits at zero. And that is really the end of the story. And I am very tired after the last sentence, so I think I shall stop there. Well, that's also a mood. <laughs> Oh, I love being able to look through some of these old stories and just see these delightful places where something that was written without any real particular intent behind it just happens to describe so much of our lives. Rage, thank you for all the adoration. You are such a wonderful being. I'm glad you're here with me tonight, and I'm glad you want to share some of that happiness with me. And... Finally, we come to chapter 10, in which Christopher Robin gives Pooh a party, and we say goodbye. <laughs> you are small and enjoyable, Rage. Oh, naturally, Dark Bogart, you're quite the talented individual. I'm delighted to be able to share, you know, the, your art with this community. It's a grand thing. It really is. One day, when the sun had come back over the forest, bringing with it the scent of May, and all the streams of the forest were tinkling happily to find themselves their own pretty shape again, and the little pools lay dreaming of the life they had seen and the big things they had done, and the warmth and quiet of the forest and the cuckoo was trying over his voice carefully and listening to see if he liked it, and the wood pigeons were complaining gently to themselves in their lazy, comfortable way that it was the other fellow's fault, but it didn't matter very much. On such a day as this, Christopher Robin whistled in a special way he had, and Owl came flying out of the Hundred Acre Wood to see what he wanted. Uh, I'm not sure what you're thanking me for, Kevry, but... I'm delighted that you're happy with it. Rage, I'm glad you're enjoying sitting on a lap. Mm. 
Owl, said Christopher Robin, I am going to give a party. Oh, you are, are you? said Owl. And it's a very special sort of party, because it's for because of what Pooh did when he did what he did to save Piglet from the flood. Oh, that's what it's for, is it? Yes, so will you tell Pooh as quickly as you can, and all the others, because it will be tomorrow. Oh, it will, will it? said Owl, still being as helpful as possible. So, will you go on and tell them, Owl? Owl tried to think of something very wise to say, but couldn't. So he flew off to tell the others, and the first person he told was Pooh. Oh, Heffrey, so sweet of you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you right back. You've been a wonderful support. You're a grand friend. You're one of the reasons I have the confidence to stream these things at all. I know it sometimes can be very hectic and we don't get to talk as much as I should like, but I've really enjoyed the time that we've spent together. And you've done an absolutely grand job of making sure that I feel welcome, that I feel safe, that I feel happy. I can't thank you enough for it, Caffrey. So, I'm just more grateful than I will have words for. And as our listeners can tell, I have quite a few words. Ooh, Owl said. Christopher Robin is having a party. Oh, said Pooh. And then, seeing that Owl expected him to say something else, he said, Will there be those little cake things with the pink sugar icing? Oh, Tiny Foxtrot, hello! And <laughs> thank you for coming in. I'm so sorry, you're coming in actually at the very end of the story. We have finished the flood and are preparing a party in celebration of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> But I'm glad you've come by and hope that you enjoy your time with us here. Owl felt that it was rather beneath him to talk about little cakes with pink sugar icing, so he told Pooh exactly what Christopher Robin had said and flew off to Eeyore. <laughs> yes, Rage, it will be a partay. Wait, am I saying that right? Partay? 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 I don't know, I'm sure it's one of those, although I'd call it a party myself. A party for me? thought Pooh to himself. How grand! And he began to wonder if all the other animals would know it was a special Pooh party, and if Christopher Robin had told them about the floating bear and the brain of Pooh, and all the wonderful ships he had invented and sailed on, and he began to think how awful it would be if everyone had forgotten about it and nobody quite knew what the party was for. And the more he thought like this, the more the party got muddled in his mind, like a dream when nothing goes right. And the dream began to sing itself over in his head until it became a sort of song. It was an anxious Pooh song. <laughs> Party in the chat! Wonderful! Parté! Parté! I, I, I'm not certain I'm pronouncing this right, but I'm delighted we're having parties in the chat. Three cheers for Pooh! For who? For Pooh! Well, my, what did he do? I thought you knew. He saved his best friend from a wedding. Three cheers for Bear! For where? For Bear, he couldn't swim, but he rescued him. He rescued who? Oh, listen, do, for I am talking of Pooh. Of who? Of Pooh. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. Well, Pooh was a bear of enormous brain. Just say it again, of enormous brain. Of enormous what? Well, he ate a lot, and I don't know if he could swim or not, but he managed to float on a sort of boat. A sort of what? Well, a sort of pot. So now let's give him three hearty cheers. So now let's give him three hearty wishes? 
and hope he'll be with us for years and years and grow in health and wisdom and riches three cheers for poo for who for poo three cheers for bear for where for bear three cheers for the wonderful winnie the pooh just tell me somebody what did he do while this was going on inside him owl was talking to eeyore eeyore said owl christopher robin is giving a party very interesting said eeyore I suppose they will be sending me down with odd bits which get trodden on. Kind and thoughtful. Not at all. Don't mention it. There is an invitation for you. What's that like? An invitation. Yes, I heard you. Who dropped it? This isn't anything to eat. It's asking you to the party tomorrow. Eeyore shook his head slowly. You mean Piglet, the fellow with the decided ears. That's Piglet. I'll tell him. No, no, said Owl, getting quite fussy. It's for you. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Christopher Robin said all of them. Tell all of them. All of them except Eeyore? All of them, said Owl sulkily. Ah, a mistake, no doubt. But still, I shall come. Only don't blame me if it rains. But it didn't rain. Christopher Robin made a long table out of some long pieces of wood, and they all sat round it. Christopher Robin sat at one end, and Pooh sat at the other, and between them on one side were Owl and Eeyore and Piglet, and between them on the other side were Rabbit and Drew and Kanga, and all Rabbit's friends and relations spread themselves out on the grass, and waited hopefully in case anybody spoke to them, or dropped anything, or asked them the time. It was the first party to which Rue had ever been, and he was very excited. As soon as they ever got sat down, he began to talk. Hello, Pooh. Hello, Rue. Rue jumped up and down in his seat for a little while, and then began again. Hello, Piglet. Piglet waved his paw at him, being too busy to say anything. Hello, Eeyore. Eeyore nodded gloomily at him. It'll rain soon. You see if it doesn't. Rue looked to see if it didn't, and it didn't. So he said, Hello, Owl. And Owl said, Hello, my dear little fellow. In a kindly way, and went on telling Christopher Robin about an accident which had nearly happened to a friend of his, whom Christopher Robin didn't know. And Kanga said to Rue, Drink up your milk first, dear, and talk afterwards. So Roo, who was drinking his milk, tried to say that he could do both at once, and had to be patted on the back and dried for quite a long time afterward. Well, book, way to call me out over a century later. To, to, to just point out that yes, I have tried talking while drinking, and no, it... it not exactly go the way I wanted it to. But I didn't need a book pointing out that that's how talking and drinking work. Hmm. And again, I say, hmm. <laughs> when they had all eaten nearly enough, Christopher Robin banged on the table with his spoon. And everybody stopped talking and was silent, except Rue, who was just finishing a loud attack of hiccups and trying to look at it as if it was one of Rabbit's relations. <laughs> okay, well, Ventriloquist might be able to do it. I don't think I can. But, 
since we've already made it into this deeply silly place. I saw her. Oh. Might as well try. <clears throat> I'm okay. I'm okay. <clears throat> but I don't think I will be trying that again anytime in the near future. So, from this, we can conclude that I am many things, but I am not a ventriloquist chat, and I don't think I will be trying to drink and narrate a book at the same time. This party, said Christopher Robin, is a party because of someone did, and we all know who it was, and it's his party because of what he did, and... I've got presents for him, and here it is. Then he felt about a little and whispered, Uh, where is it? While he was looking, Eeyore coughed in an impressive way and began to speak. Friends, including oddments, it is a great pleasure, or perhaps I had better say it has been a pleasure so far, to see you at my party. What I did was nothing. Any of you, except Rabbit and Owl and Kanga, would have done the same. Oh, and Pooh. My remarks do not, of course, apply to Piglet and Roo, because they are too small. Any of you would have done the same. Hello, Elise. Thank you for dropping in. It's good to see you. But it just happened to be me. It was not, I need hardly say, with an idea of getting what Christopher Robin is looking for now. And he... And he put his front leg to his mouth and said in a loud whisper, Try under the table. That I did. But because I feel we should all do what we can do to help. I feel that we should all... Huh, huh, said Rue accidentally. Rue, dear, said Kanga reproachfully. Oh, was it me? asked Rue, a little surprised. Oh, what's everyone talking about? Piglet asked to Pooh. I don't know, said Pooh rather dolefully. I thought it was your party. I thought it was once. But I suppose it isn't. I'd sooner it was yours than Eeyore's. Well, so would I. <laughs> said Rue again. As I was saying... Said Eeyore loudly and sternly. As I was saying when I was interrupted by various loud sounds, I feel that... Here it is, cried Christopher Robin excitedly. Pass it down to silly old Pooh. It's for Pooh. For Pooh? Said Eeyore. Of course it is. The best bear in all the world. I might have known, said Eeyore. After all, one can't complain. I have my friends. Somebody spoke to me only yesterday, and it was last week or the week before that that Rabbit bumped into me and said, Father, the social round. Always something going on. Nobody was listening, for they were all saying, Open it, Pooh, and what is it, Pooh, and I know what it is. No, you don't. And all other helpful remarks of this sort. And of course, Boo was opening it as quickly as ever he could, but without cutting the string, because you never know when a bit of string might be useful. 
At last, it was undone. When Pooh saw what it was, he nearly fell down, he was so pleased. It was a special pencil case. There were pencils in it marked B for bear, and special pencils marked HB for helping bear, and pencils marked BB for brave bear. There was a knife for sharpening the pencils, and india rubber for rubbing out anything which you had spelt wrong, and a ruler for ruling lines for the words to walk on, and inches marked on the ruler in case you wanted to know how many inches anything was, and blue pencils and red pencils and green pencils for saying special things in blue and red and green. And all these lovely things were in little pockets of their own, in a special case which was shut with a click when you clicked it. And they were all for Pooh. Oh! Said Pooh. Oh, Pooh! Everybody else said except Eeyore. Thank you! Growled Pooh. But Eeyore was saying to himself, This writing business, pencils and whatnot, overrated if you ask me. Silly stuff. Nothing in it. <laughs> Interesting that a character from a storybook should think so little of writing when writing is how that character comes to be. But I suppose such is the nature of all things. We never truly have much of an appreciation for how we got where we are once we are. Well, those of us that do are simply spending more time appreciating than what one might expect. Or perhaps I've simply been affected by how silly the story is and its storytelling style and come to say something silly all of my own. <clears throat> all right, and that was a hydration. That didn't leave me coughing and stuttering. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for the duck on the toilet? I'm, I'm not sure what that's meant to be, Rage, but thank you for it all the same. <laughs> but later on, when they had all said goodbye and thank you to Christopher Robin, Pooh and Piglet walked home thoughtfully together in the golden evening, and for a long time they were silent. When you wake up in the morning, Pooh. Er, oh, goodness sake, I'm sorry. When you wake up in the morning, Pooh, said Piglet at last, what's the first thing you say to yourself? What's for breakfast? What do you say, Piglet? I say, I wonder what's going to happen exciting today. Pooh nodded thoughtfully. It's the same thing. And what did happen? One. The next morning? I don't know. Could you think and tell me and Pooh sometime? If you wanted it very much. Oh, Dark Blogart, uh, thank you so much for the lurkies. Um, I don't have a separate command set up for it, but I'm glad you've chosen to. Who does want it very much? said Christopher Robin. He gave a deep sigh, picked his bear up by the leg, and walked off to the door, trailing Winnie the Pooh behind him. At the door, he turned and said, Coming to see me have my bath? I might. Was Pooh's pencil case any better than mine? It was just the same. He nodded and went out, and a moment later, I heard Winnie the Pooh bump, bump, Bump. going up the stairs behind him. And that is the end of the adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Hmm. We are just about two hours in here. Uh, last time I tried to run a poll. <laughs> I think it's a very grand book. Thank you for recommending it, Tiny. 
And thank you for encouraging me to also read it uh, out loud, Joes. I think this has been quite a nice one to share with everybody, and I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, let's see. I am still not able to do polls. So, unfortunately, I don't have a trivial way to let people decide what story we read next or if we should switch over to something else. Um, I'd be curious to hear if anyone in the chat has a preference for a book to try looking at next. Um, but either direction. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that we got to share this story here, and I, I had quite a bit of fun reading it. Um, there are several other stories in the series uh, relating to Pooh and the Hundred Acre Wood and Christopher Robin and all of their friends. One, two, three, and have you vote like that? Hmm. <laughs> the portrait of Dorian Gray. Oh, my tiny. Uh, that is... Hmm. <clears throat> Well, it meets many of the criteria that I have for telling stories. Um, at the same time, that one is a little more advanced than the stuff that I've been reading. Um, and I, I question whether or not the other people on stream would be interested in such a thing. Um, but I'd certainly be willing to give it another read. You know what, Kefri? Let, let, me, uh, let me see if I can do this here. Um... I can't tell if I am allowed to make you a moderator here or not. Oh, yep. There we go. You are more than welcome to try setting up a poll. Um, the way that I normally do it is with the slash poll command, and wouldn't you know it, it was not letting me do it. So, if you want me to take the moderator responsibilities back from you later, I'm certainly willing to. But... <laughs> Uh, Rage, Harry Potter books are not in the public domain. Uh, they are currently trademarked by uh, Disney Publishing, actually, which purchased Hyperion a few years ago. So I do not want to get on Disney's bad side at this point. Um, so unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to uh, do Harry Potter at this time. Um, as much as I would be very tempted to. I, uh, so let's put Little Women in the poll. Let's put the picture of Dorian Gray. Um, let's put the adventures of Arsène Lupin, Gentleman Bandit. Um, which I believe we actually have Arsène Lupin right over here. This would be a very easy one to, uh, go back into. I think we were at a chapter break, were we not? Um, do we have any other suggestions in the chat? Um, I know I've also had some people request that I start doing some Edgar Allan Poe on the channel. Um, I would be willing to do The Gold Bug. Or Sherlock Holmes. Okay, uh, yes, we could do a study in Scarlet. And I think those are going to be the ones that we'll put in for now. Uh, Rage, Goosebumps books are actually copyrighted by the same company. Um, Scholastic, I believe, was purchased by Hyperion a while back. Um, we could certainly trace that down, but uh, yes, uh, Goosebumps were written in the 80s and 90s. They are well within the copyright period. Um, Okay, so Kefri and I have the same problem. Um, Kefri, have you been able to do polls for uh, Lulilura? Which, you know, of course, this is a grand excuse to shout out Lulilura, who was kind enough to create the uh, overlay that I use and is also a very talented streamer. Um... Unfortunately, we don't get to see as much of her as I should like. Uh, but yes, The Portrait of Dorian Gray, Little Women, uh, The Extraordinary Adventures of Arsène... Let's just put Arsène Lupin, for brevity's sake, as number three. 
Fair enough. Let me remove the pressure from you as well, then. Uh, you are no longer a mod, Kefri. Uh, Arsene Lupin, and uh, yes, a study in Scarlet, and five would be the gold bug. All right, so if people have a preference here, I would be delighted to hear what folks think in chat uh, in terms of what they'd like to see next. Um, it sounds like Tiny is most interested in having a study in Scarlet, which, you know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is a good author. <laughs> I am happy to share some of his work. Uh, okay, Rage would also like to see a study in Scarlet. <clears throat> And if you don't have a preference, I'd appreciate you putting a zero in, just so I know that you're, you know, at least not going to say anything further, which is totally fair. <clears throat> well, thank you, Caffrey, and I do appreciate that. Um, at this time, I don't think I need a mod. My chat's just generally been absolutely fantastic people who are happy to drop in and be supportive and kind and helpful. I, I'm I'm delighted at everybody who's been able to come in and share their time and uh, energy with me. It's it's a remarkable thing, and I, I can't tell you just how much being able to share this time with everyone has really it it's just it has helped me pass through some very difficult days um particularly in the last week there, there's been a lot of personal stuff going on that i don't talk about on stream and would not be likely to but the people here everybody who is happy to come and spend their time with me it's tremendous. Oh, uh, stories that I've created. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I've, I've got a few things that I've written. Um, let me, uh, see if I can pull one up here real quick. Um, that'll take me just a moment to find. Um, uh, oddly enough, I do not keep the stuff that I've written sitting right, you know, up front and center here. But, uh, oh, that was, that was not actually what I wanted to do. Um, boom. Let's see, I'm trying to find where my posts are. Um, it's been a little while since I looked this up. <laughs> um, so something that I do occasionally do is I go into Reddit's uh, writing prompts subreddit, and I will simply reply to some of the prompts there. Um, let's see, comments, I think? Um... Too. Okay. Um, yeah, that would be my guess, Kefri, is that polls are specifically something that uh, are probably affiliate level. Um, I, I am not currently affiliate. Um, I think I'm either one or two streams away from affiliate at this point. Um, but the other criteria have actually been met. Again, thanks to the wonderful people who have showed up, who have lurked, who have uh, watched and enjoyed everything along with me here. So, um, let's see. Um, 
I'm just scrolling down trying to find some of the ones that, uh, this one might work. Let's try... So, oh, I don't know if it's taking me directly to my post here. Um, I'm actually going to pull this back until I get to the right post. Uh, oh, thank you for the compliments, guys. I, I really appreciate it. Um, it's just... <laughs> two hours reached, yep. Uh, and two hours is a pretty common time that uh, that, that these run for, but I, I think I would like to keep going for at least a little while longer. Um, let's see. Maybe this will do it? Ah, there we are. Alright, so uh, this was a post that I put up about eight months ago. Um, we'll have to resize things just a little bit so it actually fits in the screen here. Um, but the original prompt was, uh, what should I create a horror story about? And somebody told, uh, said, a controller or keyboard that has the mysterious any button, uh, from press any button to continue fame. So... With that. Well, what do you think? Colin knew more about computers than any of us. He had been hoarding old tech and junk for ages, and this machine was one that had us stumped. The case was clearly old, the yellow sepia creme color of an ancient device from the 1970s. Heavy as all heck, too. We'd managed to cart the beast of a box down three flights of stairs to the basement of his grandmother's apartment building. He'd help us pull the wagon into his room, with its windowless walls of sheer concrete and a single incandescent bulb hanging bare from the rafters. He hoisted it onto his work desk as though it were the lightest thing in the world and began to examine it, running his fingers along ports and wires we'd never seen before. This wasn't a surprise. Most of us were born after CDs went extinct. It was always fun to learn what Colin knew, though. We gathered, wide-eyed, and waited while he poked around. Huh. Can't say as I've seen this model before. He pulled his head back from the behind the machine, drawing a thin hand through his sandy red hair. He spun it around so the front was facing everyone, with its small slots and tiny tags which held a faded logo. The keyboard was attached to the front, and Colin let his hands drift over the different buttons. Eh! <laughs> Someone had a sense of humor. This one has a few extra keys. Look, this one says any. This one says every. And this one even simply says nope. Colin's eyes began to light up, and he let his fingers slide to the power button. The noise it let out was ear-piercing. We all covered our ears, but it did nothing. Colin pushed the button again, and the noise only grew louder. He reached behind the machine and switched off the protector, then unplugged it, and yet everything he did caused the noise to grow. Sound echoed in our heads, making the world around us seem to grow and shrink at the same time. I'm pretty sure I fell to the ground at some point, but none of us felt anything but the searing pain from the noise as it resonated through our heads, our chests, and even seemed to turn our whole bodies into something hollow and filled with waves of crashing agony. As we thought we could feel nothing more, images began to flash on the monitor. The pictures came quickly, one after another. An old lady on a porch, a cat in her hands. Behind her, a train came through the door. A wolf howled at the great piano potato in the sky, which absorbed all light and left only a trail of sadness and void in its wake. An impossible series of limbs, warped and writhing, looking at once like a spider and a fish, wrapped its arms around a screaming Colin. An empty tracksuit on the woman's porch, the train tracks over it, remaining the only evidence of the locomotive's passing. The potato had fallen from the sky, and the wolf sobbed mournfully into the old lady's cat. And at last, the sound began to drift off into the distance. The cacophony subsided, and our bodies began to feel whole again. Ourselves and our pulses 
and everything seemed to be left in its place. We stood up and looked around as Colin's grandmother entered the room, peeking in with a confused glance. And just who are you, little ones? I looked to my friends, and then back to the woman who had led us into the building just a moment ago. We're Colin's friends. But no sooner had I said the words than her face began to twist, splitting open where her eyes had been to create a second, gaping mouth full of pointed teeth. Her limbs stretched as she strode forward, and a new sound began to hollow me out once again. I swear I heard something say, So that was his name. I'll be sure to tell him you told me, as we play together again. And the mouths descended toward me, wrapped in the creature's long, iron-hard limbs. The light bulb burst in a final shower of sparks before darkness took the whole room. So, that's the kind of stuff that I write. Um... <laughs> It seems Tiny had fun with it, at least. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sure I've got something else that I can uh, use here. Um, this one is a little bit less uh, distressing. So this particular prompt was... Uh, Dr. Seuss tells the story of the time he got pulled over on the way to the office. Um, so if you were hiding away because of the creepy stuff, the creepy stuff is over. You're welcome to come back. Uh, as we move into Dr. Seuss explaining why he got pulled over. The clock was quite loud, how it beeped and it buzzed, with me on my bed as I let out a snuzz. I opened my eyes. I did see such a sight. The small hand was left and the big one was right. I hopped out of bed with a yeepity hop. It seems I will now be late for my job. I slid in my newt suit and much speed and grace and hoped if I hurried, I might still save face for my boss would be red as tomatoey paste. So I hurried without mind for how haste makes waste. I zipped and I zooped as my car ran the lights and I slid past an old cop on my right. His siren let out a great honkity hoo and on top its bright lights shone out red and blue. The officer chased me without much ado as I rolled down my window. I drew from inside the glove box my papers we'd need. He'd pulled out his glasses and asked me my speed. I told him it this tale of my woe boss's face and of how I needed to set such a pace. He nodded and murmured with sympathy sighed and waved me along as he took on my side. And it would have been fine were my car still in first, but sadly my gear shift was set to reverse. The officer gaped at the dents in our cars and laughed as he wrote out my ticket for ours. So why I am late here you hopefully see is because I had meant to be on time and free. Though we might all have time as we wake and we stir. If you speed and they find you, a ticket is sure. So, uh, yes, I, I do have a few different styles that I can write in. Um, I'm not sure if that's as Seuss as we would like it to be, but <laughs> I'm glad you like it, Tiny. <laughs> Oh my, um, let's see what we have here, boo boo. Uh, I know we do have several people who are fond of like Dungeons and Dragons, role-playing games, high fantasy settings. So I think I am going to try reading out uh, this one here too. Uh, just put that in there. Oh, there's the enter key. Everyday problems and experiences for people in a high fantasy world. Um, 
The rodent problem has gone unchecked again, so now you have to hire someone more dangerous and expensive than the local exterminator. <laughs> oh, Kefri, if you ever want to take a couple of creatures and have me write a story, you can definitely set that up in DMs. I would be delighted to tell stories about your creatures. Maggie had a glass of mead ready for Charles as he crawled out of her root cellar. Sorry to tell you, Mags, but this one's out of my hands. They're over 20 centimeters long without the tail. Maggie sighed and let her face fall into her hands. She knew well that Chuck couldn't take on something that large, not with simple bait and a few traps. Of course, that left the local miscreants. Oh, damn it, they always knew left the cellar smelling like smoke, and she just knew one of them would make off with her prized turnips. Still, the turnips would just get eaten by the rats if she did nothing. She thanked Chuck for his time, slipped him a copper coin, and made her slow way up the hill. The house had been largely abandoned, making it quite attractive to the children whose parents had long given up any semblance of parenting. She walked up the decaying steps and tapped on the door gently with her cane, a slight tiefling opened the door while gesturing her inside. She looked around at the cobwebs and dust-filled atrium, noticing the dwarf and halfling were playing something on the uneven floorboards. A young human cleared his throat from the top of the stairs before saying, Welcome to the home of the Mighty Rangers! I thought we were the Mighty Brawlers, the dwarven girl chimed in, not missing a beat. Before that, we were the pretty prime protection practice. Just get on with asking her what she wants. The halfling rolled their eyes and flopped down, subtly swiping one of the game pieces as they sat. Well, dearies, I have a bit of a rat problem in my cellar. I don't suppose a few able-bodied youngsters might be able to help a poor old lady out? The tiefling sneezed, and a small gout of flame left the smell of sulfur hanging in the air. She just knew she was going to regret this. So... <laughs> That's one that I threw together a while back, too. Um, I don't know. Are we enjoying the stuff that I've written personally? Uh, I can't quite tell if this is something that people are specifically enjoying, if it's just my usual reading, um, or if we want to switch over to something else. I do have a few more that I can share. Um, be perfectly reasonable. But uh, I'm curious to know what you guys think. <laughs> a big enthusiastic yes from Tiny. Okay. Ah. Uh. Ah, well, Caffrey, I'm quite capable of coming up with uh, human environments and things of that nature. <laughs> Alright, um, well, I suppose I may as well engage in a little bit of shameless self-promotion then, um, because my uh, Reddit login is listed on uh, the Discord, uh, so it, it's linked there. But if you are interested in following me on Reddit and getting updates on the occasions that I do post something, um, that is the link to my Reddit page. Um, and so you're, you're more than likely, or you're more than welcome to take a look through the different things that I've written. Um, and if there's something that you saw in here that you didn't hear read out on stream and would like to hear, uh, just let me know, because I'm more than happy to share uh, the things that I've heard here. Let's see. Um... Let's, uh, let's try this one, see whether or not, uh, whether or not people find an interest with it. Caffrey, I don't want to be bonked, but I don't want people to just not be able to find this stuff either. Oh, 
Myths, hello, how are you, lovely? Thank you so much for dropping in. Um, we read through Winnie the Pooh, and I should probably uh, fix this, actually, because we finished Winnie the Pooh. So uh, we are actually currently reading... So we are actually reading just a selection of my personal writings. <laughs> oh, but I'm delighted you've chosen to join us. Um, and so uh, these writings are responses that I've done to the Reddit r slash writing prompts community. Um, and this particular prompt was an unholy place has to be exercised. While other Inquisitors pray to their god and fearfully fight for survival, you are having the best time of your life. After all, you signed up just to have fun smashing evil things with a mace. Uh, people familiar with my role-playing style would know that this is absolutely something that I would do. Oh, Mitz, I'm sorry that you've had a bad morning, and I hope that we can get you some nice, calming, um... Maybe we shouldn't do the story full of wanton slaughter and, uh, I don't know, Mitz. <laughs> Does this sound like something that you'd like to hear, or is this, uh, maybe not going to be what will help you most with your mood? Um, it's my voice, not the content. Okay. Come, my friends, what cause have you to fear? Are you not holy warriors? We ride to battle to rid the world of this scum! A large claw nearly took a large chunk out of me, but I casually leapt aside as it dug into the obsidian rock face. As it sank in, I brought my steel blade deftly into the cuticle, severing it from the finger the size of my waist. The ichor that erupted forth from the newly severed digit splattered across the rock face, steam wafting ominously from the places where it touched. The digit's owner cried in pain, a grumbling sound which rattled in my ribs. If my holy steel could cause a creature to cry like that, we had more than a fighting chance. It's as though the bones of the earth are grinding together! My fellow paladin cried out in pain, her hands desperately trying to cover her ears over her helmet. I know, right? It's glorious! Let's slaughter them to a one! I leapt upon the paw that came down, seeking retribution for its partner, and ran up along the thick fur over bones. The forearm began to lift, and I slipped my blade back between the wrist bones, wedging it there and holding on as it thrashed about in pain and confusion. The dull creature brought its hand up to its eyes for a look, and I wasted no time in pulling one of my stilettos, blessed and inscribed with words of rebuke, straight through the curious orb. The slender dagger sank deep into the slitted iris. The organ was easily the size of my head. As it filled with blood, I freed my blade. Tumbling along the hairy arm, I dug my sturdy sword deep into its flesh. My sword drank greedily. Iker spilled in its wake. It made to slap me with its other paw. I hopped onto the back of the incoming member, then sprang and caught the creature's neck. A few deft strokes left oozing wounds gaping, and the creature flailed wildly, trying in vain to stop the bleeding continued its efforts as it crashed to the ground atop several flailing bodies of its smaller ilk. Pat! Stop playing with those small fry and let's get the real fighting done! For her part, Pat was struggling. A couple of smaller creatures, the size of a child, had taken after her with their claws and begun chipping her armor and shield. I casually strode over, picked one off her back, sinking a stiletto deep into its throat. See? Nothing to it. Now you try! I handed her another one, and she managed to slay the one in front of her. Her hand shook a little as she sunk the blade in, and its wobbling made for a less than clean kill. Close, dearie. Just a little more to the right. No worries, we have plenty more to practice on! Dozens of the critters had dashed at us, and I brought, brought by the sight of their fallen comrades. Pat and I faced them as I showed her the pattern. Catch, stab, pull, repeat. Her arms were tiring a little, but the creature's number had thinned considerably. Nearby, Ali chanted her earnest prayers, hallowing the spaces we cleared about her. She gathered these warriors herself, a beacon for those beset by terrors. She stood forth, 
she shone. From her, they took inspiration. They rallied at the sound of her voice. Her daughters stood nearby, calling and listening, learning the art. I cast her a nod as I scanned for a target. One of them found me, a paw to the head. My helmet deflected the brunt of the blow. I whirled on it. Broadsword flashed out in a hot arc and Iker was scattered along with its paw. The monster's great jaws opened wide with a howl, and right through the roof of its mouth my blade slipped. Kicking it off of my sword with a small grunt, I jumped on its fellow, which followed behind. Pat, can you keep the little ones for now? I've got to clear a shot to these little hellhounds, I called out, making sure she would see her duties clearly. She nodded, a newfound fire in her eyes. I leapt from critter to critter, still slashing. A thrust here, a chop there, block open a mouth, a kick to some soft spot, a punch to the eye. Creatures surrounded me, falling each way. I passed by four warriors fighting a troll, and casually hamstrung the great creature as I walk by. They'll learn from the fighting, from felling the beastie, because there's a different one I want to try. This one was massive, and struck with abandon, no blade seemed to dent it, no fire could fry. I stood in its sightline and clanged on my large shield, drawing its face as its tail swept my friends. I'll have you! I cried out as visions of my home swam in my head. The people I'd loved, who'd raised me, who'd cared for me, had all been brought to heal by this monster. Countless others had been shaken off its paws, but run from the beast, ready to be free from it. They would try to pull others away from its clutches or pull them from its path. I had chosen to study it and learn how to bring it to heal. The creature turned to me, its eyes glowing with white fire as it planted a foot in front of me. Its wings beat hard, creating a heavy breeze in front of me. I felt my hair waver under my helmet, steadied my grip on my sword and shield, and called out, Come! Let us dance! As it was in the beginning! Its enormous blade smashed down in front of me, carving a deep crease in the rocks between my feet. I took my own blade, placed it in the first finger, and sliced finger held, but the hilt of the sword cracked. Is now! It struck with its offhand, and I slid aside, striking again at the handle of the sword. The crack deepened, creasing through the massive shaft. And will be forever! I kicked out, and the blade's hilt snapped in two, the entire instrument falling to the ground with its crash. You cannot win this world. A voice echoed in my head as the creature stepped back, disarmed. So you say, but one need not only fight one way. You've lost your weapon. Your steel lies in ruins. You know how this will go. Fall back, take them with you, and let us continue. Molest us no further, you creature of faith. The creature's head cocked to the side, white flames blazing as it peered into me. Very well. We fall back! The tide of creatures backed away as we stood on the ground we'd taken. I watched my friends gather in victory. Quietly nodding, I settled a little way off, just out of range of their raucous celebration. Sunbeam Cow, thank you so much for joining! Lovely to meet you! <laughs> Pat quietly slid down beside me. You fought it off. I did. Come, join the party. There's a celebration as we clean this, cleanse this place for our own. I can't. Pat looked at me, then noticed the color of my hair as it slid out from under my helmet. You're... Mm-hmm, I confirmed, grunting as I slid back onto my feet. Unlike you... There isn't really a place for me in a purified space. Go. Be with them. You deserve it. I'll be here when you need. Keep them safe for me, as best as you can. She nodded, tears in her eyes, and I patted her head as she gave me one last hug. I walked off into the distance, finding my tent in the hidden cave where I came to rest. Taking off my armor, I let my fur spill forth and flexed my wings as I unfolded them from their protective casing. I 
I should probably change this here. So, uh, I'm not sure if that was one of the writings that uh, people were interested in hearing, but, uh, you know, it's another of those things. Uh, yes, Kefri, I'm aware that probably could have sounded like cat fairly easily. <laughs> um, let's see. You're right, that was Mitz, wasn't it? Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. You two are using the same color and I wasn't paying close enough attention, Mitz. But that was my bad. But, I hope that you've all been enjoying here. Um, what do you think, folks? Do we want to do more of these uh, Reddit writing prompts that I've responded to? Or is there something else that we'd rather do? Um, again, I'm perfectly happy to keep going with this. But, uh... Oh, actually, um, this is rather embarrassing, but I am going to have to take just a little bit of a break here. So, uh, as I so often do, I will be right back. <laughs> oh, oh, you know what? Yes, Sunbeam Cow, uh, if you just got here, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, we'll find one more, and then I'm going to take my break, because I, I am actually going to need it. Uh, let me pull up another of these here. Um, boo -boo -boo. <laughs> uh... With his mother's health failing and doctors unable to find the cause, a superhero turns to his mad scientist arch-rival in a desperate bid for a cure. <sighs> Victoria never really got a chance to just sit and enjoy a night in front of the television. Yeah, she had her patents and her shell companies to keep her funded. Sure, there were a variety of inventions she'd made, so she never had to attend to menial labor. Oh, uh, yeah, Link, thank you so much for dropping in. It was good to see you. Uh, hope you have a lovely time, and uh, we hope to see you next time here, too. Even with those lovely details handled, there never seemed to be enough time to sit like this with a tub of chocomint ice cream and a black and white documentary on the screen. She had just finished the intro sequence when her front door burst to splinters. Oh, for goodness sake! She grumbled and grabbed one of her tools, a particularly nasty looking ray which would disassemble any inorganic object caught in its path. Damn kids next door had gotten it into their heads lately that their guns made them invincible god kings. She was ready to show them exactly how mistaken they were when the crusader blew into her room. A bundle of rags in his hands. No, wait. That's not a bundle of rags. That's... She looks like she's on death's doorstep. Here, bring her here. Victoria cleared off the table, scattering a few plans she knew she'd never bother completing, and a few hardy containers would survive the tumble to the ground. Crusader drifted into the living room, setting the frail woman on the table. She looked like all the fat and muscle had been sucked from her body, barely more than a skeleton covered in wrinkled, thin skin. I... please... The doctors have said there's no hope. I, I have no one left to... The crusader began, stammering. Seeing this woman so afflicted must have left him near the breaking point. Okay, no. Skip the weepy bits. What happened to her? I need details, diagnoses, anything useful. Victoria's eyes took in every detail, from the bone structure to the way bits of her seemed to melt beneath her very eyes, to the fingernails that looked long until she noticed how far back the cuticles had pulled. It's disease, they said. Something flesh-eating and beyond modern medical experience that attacks the... He looked away, embarrassed, as Victoria opened the woman's gowns and began checking over her abdomen, noticing how it seemed swollen and misshapen. 
The doctor pulled one of her scopes from the nearby table and began inspecting the woman's belly, gesturing for the hero to continue. The fat and muscles makes them her seem to starve almost instantly. Well, now this was interesting. Hey, hand me that tub of ice cream. Time for just a little bit of research, just to see some details of how this progressed. The hero snapped up the tub and hurled it straight at the doctor's head. Victoria caught it easily and scooped a few spoonfuls into the woman's mouth. It slid down easily, and her eyes closed in bliss for a moment, before opening again in a silent scream of agony. This is going to be a good one! A disease indeed. This one's a parasite. Here, hold this. She handed a particularly wicked-looking saw-toothed object to the crusader. It didn't do anything. She'd never installed the motor or even a battery compartment. But giving him something this cruel-looking made his face blanch. And she never got to see him when he was this unsettled. The look of mild panic in his eyes was worth more than a solid gold brick. Here, we just set this here. Put these bits here. Uh, no, wait. Hey, Alex! Prepare Extraction Pod 3, Parasite Class Gamma 4. Okay. I'm preparing Pod 3 for Parasite Extraction and Containment, came the robotic voice from her phone. You can help? You're going to help? Yes, of course I'm helping you. Do you know how many people could pull this off at all? Least of all while wearing their pajamas? Victoria carefully gathered the woman's body from the rags and set her into the pod, letting the green liquid within cover the frail being. Apparently the Crusader hadn't noticed her clothes until she pointed them out, because his eyes suddenly became very flick fixed on her slender, unshaved legs poking out from her oversized nightgown. That suited her just fine, she needed him to not focus on the plans she had up on the wall for her next heist. She slid over to a glowing panel and entered the details for parasite extraction, and the machine began to swirl menacingly. <laughs> I'm glad you're liking it, Kefri. Will it... She be okay? Yes, of course, she'll be fine. The machine will need a few hours to finish removing the parasites, and then she'll need some time recovering in a normal hospital. She'll be malnourished, and I doubt she'll have kids anytime soon, but your girlfriend there won't be in any real danger. The Crusader coughed violently. <coughs> Actually, uh, she's my mother. Huh. She's well preserved. Victoria casually strode over to the duvet, plopping back down and picking up her tub of ice cream as she resumed the documentary. Just for fun, she hummed along with the opening theme, knowing full well she was off-key the entire time. Well, um, a few hours, huh? Yep, not much to do on our end, just waiting. I extracted something similar from the Governator last month. It took a few hours before he was back in his whole iron rule thing. I kind of expected you to resist a bit. Eh, I'm in this for the challenge. I don't have any grudge against some rando's mother. Look, you're making me uncomfortable standing there all awkward and stiff-like. Just take a seat wherever. You want some? She offered to the half-eaten tub with the spoon embedded in it. He looked at the tub for a moment, then pushed it back to her gently. So, every time I bust up your machines and send you packing... Yeah, it just means I need to keep working at getting better with my designs. Honestly, most of left, us left still in it are because we enjoy messing with you. You can put this thing down, by the way. Uh, yeah, at any rate, crime doesn't pay in this city. So for the rest of us, it's a passion project now. Crusader set the non-functional tool down and curled up under a nearby blanket on the duvet, making himself as comfortable as he could get with his mother in his arch-rival's lair. It took three episodes for the parasite to be removed, and he and his mother from he and as he took his mother from the pod, the crusader nodded to Victoria and thanks. I'm not sure how to thank you, but thanks. Ah, no worries. Now hurry up and get her to a proper hospital. She'll need some more conventional medical attention, and drop back sometime when you're not busy. Victoria may have found a new favorite challenge, seeing what other faces she could get the crusader to make. And in the meanwhile, she had a parasite to deliver to a few politicians whose opinions on healthcare she disagreed with. <laughs> so, that's kind of what happens when I try writing superhero stuff. Um, 
But I, I really do need to take just a moment here. So I am going to go back into be right back mode. <laughs> uh, oh, Mitz, I'm glad you liked it. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it, guys. I'll be right back. All right, and I am back here. Um, and thank you so much for your patience with me. Uh, Caffrey, I, I thought you might appreciate the parasite bit, but that sounds like what you would fixate on. Uh, Mitz, if you'd like to see more of this, I'm certainly open to expanding the story a little bit. Uh, I, I like the characters, I like the overall setting. Um, there are two kinds of writing prompts that I reply to for the most part. Um, they are ones that are superhero related, or they are ones that are uh, vampire monster hunter type things. Um, so uh, it, the ones I've been reading out here tonight have been just kind of me trying to pick a wider variety so people get more of a sampling of what kinds of stuff I tend to write. But um, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't mind adding this to the list of stories that I expand on. Um, so if that's the something that you would like to hear more of, uh, yeah, let's write more. Let's put more of it out there. Uh, because the more that we put out into the world, the more there is for other people to work with as well. Um, I know that it's important to me that I'm able to tell stories. And that doesn't happen if everybody just kind of keeps their stuff under lock and key. I know Rage has even brought up a couple of stories that they'd like to hear that I can't read because of copyright. So um, I'm happy to share these stories, and I hope that this is something that people get a bit of a kick out of. Uh, yeah, like the SCP Foundation too. Um, and as I think about it, I might technically be able to read some of the SCPs out here. Um, I would have to check their license, which that sounds extremely boring to do on stream, but I certainly could. Um, so it's an option, uh, but I, I think, uh, let's see, so we've done, uh, I think I probably have one more of these in me. Um, 
Nah, you know what? I shouldn't say that. I should see how far we can take this. Uh, just, let's see where it goes. <laughs> oh. Thank you for uh, enjoying my voice this much. Um, and if you're interested, I did actually read the updated Twitch Terms of Service. Uh, they, they did a very quiet update the other day. Um, I don't know if I have that up on my YouTube yet or not, but uh, yeah, if you want to see what happens when I read a license agreement, that, that's actually a thing that exists. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Boring read, but still fun. Uh, I believe my favorite quote from Kefri on that episode was, uh, they say that video games rot your brains. No, video games don't rot your brains. Reading the whole terms of service rots your brains. <laughs> uh... SCP says you can use and profit from the ideas and stories on the site, but the ideas must be published on the site for others to use. Um, oh, yeah, I, I can link to my YouTube here real quick. Uh, give me just a moment to pull it up. Again, it's been a minute since I tried to promote myself on, well, anything. Um... Do logged in as my account here uh, that's not the right button oh for goodness sake why does Google make this in any way shape or form a difficult thing to do um, the back rooms are kind of inspired by some things in SCP and they're making a movie about SCPs that doesn't surprise me uh, SCPs have been pretty darned cool for quite a while here um, I'm not certain how interesting it would be to just read the reports directly out, but I suppose I certainly could. Um, oh, I think here's the button. Sorry, this is taking me just a moment. Nope, looks like I did not finish uploading that video, so I will try and get that up there a little bit later here tonight. Um, boo -boo. Oh, uh... Well, if you found one that has uh, the three billy goats gruff as the only thing up there, and wow, that was one that I made using my previous avatar. So that's good to know. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll be putting uh, some additional videos up. Um, in addition, I'm going to be putting the uh, videos on demand for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, uh, which we finished reading a couple of streams ago, and then also the... Uh, I'm probably just going to combine them into one particularly long video, uh, which is the Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Um, oh, thank you for sending me the link, Mitz. I appreciate it. Um, wow, I'm going to end up with a whole bunch of DMs by the end of the night here. <laughs> ah! Um... But yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. So for the meanwhile here, let's see if we can find In fact, I might just do the last one that I submitted here is kind of my next one. Blood and Honey? I guess I'm not familiar with that. Popular Celine. <laughs> well, thank you, Rage. Um, I, I appreciate it. Alright, so this prompt was, Under no circumstances should the wizard be allowed to drink. Oh, damn it. Luke shook his head. Blaze the Magnificent was rosy-cheeked and slurring his speech as he slid over to yet another annoyed-looking woman. Michael smirked at him from across the table. Bit worse than you expected, the heavily armored paladin asked, chuckling to himself. I don't get it. They lock his door, he magics it back open. Tie him up, he just escapes. 
I pulled a cask of Amontillado on him earlier and he just teleported right back here. How am I supposed to stop him? I mean, we will need to talk about how you potentially, how potentially lethal that is. But let's come back to that later. Do you understand now why we told you not to help him fall off the wagon? The question was punctuated with a slap that echoed throughout the wooden tavern, and Blaze sported a new red welt across his face. Look, you told me he's an alcoholic, but so am I, and I do fine. Yeah, about that, I'm pretty sure you just have no... Michael quietly caught Luke's fist as it tried to slip into a nearby maid's pocket. Impulse control. Luke shot Michael a glare. I figured once he sobered up, he'd have a hangover and be done. Yep, sounds like you don't know that gnawing constant need for just a little more. Our friend over there will sober up once he's drunk the town dry and not a moment sooner. In the meanwhile, you know the penalty for breaking the rule. Blaze chose this moment to turn, kiss Luke's lip with his breath that smelled like vomit and death, and pass out on the floor. Picking Blaze up, Luke grumbled, Yeah, yeah, if you get the wizard drunk, he is your responsibility until he sobers up. So, yeah, that's... I had a bad night. <laughs> that, that's how that one came about. Uh... Well, that, that's... <laughs> Wizards, what are you gonna do, right? <laughs> oh, and I missed this, but thank you for the follow, Sunbeam, Kyle. I really appreciate it. Uh, let's see here. I think I've got another that we can do. They're... Some of these are fairly short, thankfully. An armed robber attempts to rob someone at gunpoint. The armed robber's surprised. The man he attempts to rob has a death wish. <laughs> Bippity boppity, the wizard's now drunk. You're not wrong. <laughs> Admits, yes, the, the drunk wizard slurring spells and creating chaos. You got this. Ooh, that's a drawer buster, isn't it? One of the new models? I've been meaning to drop by, but th there are so few places to get them. How heavy is it? Okay, stand back. This doesn't have to get... Charlie drifted closer. But it's supposed to be one of the most potent off the market. High penetration and the incendiary rounds that come standard with it are a real treat. Lethal for almost anything corporeal. Mickey didn't even register it happening. The trigger was so light, so simple. He knew he fired and the blinding light faded, he could only register a burning in his gut, and his own face staring down at him. The image faded, and if the shot hadn't left the body deaf, he might have heard Charlie say from inside of Mickey's body, Thanks for being someone I can t take with a clean conscience. Enjoy whatever lies beyond. I'll enjoy this life you were so ready to throw away. But of course, burnt ash cannot listen, nor can it reply. Charlie's former body crumbled and blew away in the wind, along with Mickey's consciousness. Let's see here. <laughs> Burned ash can listen if it's a th phoenix's ash. You are not wrong. Um, that that's. All right, doop doop doop. You are about to tell your supervillain dad that you want to be a her. Hope it goes well. Uh, by the way, the poster of this original prompt clarified later that they just misspelled hero. But 
almost all of the responses were very explicitly like trans related so i i jumped on the bad wagon with this i fully admit that there's there was no way this was going to be anything but that level of silly okay i got my uniform of uniform my sword of righteousness my mask of justice this is going to work i checked my gear for the third time talking myself up in the mirror i wasn't really sure what to think he told me growing up how rotten the world is for its expectations how i need to forge my own path and do what i feel is right his views on what is right often included overthrowing those in power in other countries and removing useless people from the population and if he could feel that way, I could respect all life and fight to keep people safe, regardless of how they talk or how little they earn from work. Everything padded, feeling the most like myself I had in a while, I made my way out the door of my room and into the Capitol's corridors. I nodded to Paul, the man who had kept watch over my room, knowing I was about to violate the beliefs of the very man who put him there. Paul had stopped all kinds of plots by rebel factions to kidnap me as leverage or kill me in retribution. And I was super grateful. But I also knew we had to change things. As much as I appreciated his role in keeping me safe, it was time to start on a new and dangerous job. He patted my shoulder. Finally decided to tell him today, huh? Yep. He deserves to know. I have no idea if I'll make it back once I start, and who knows? Maybe things will change if I let him know first. He might just start to see things in a new way. I'm sure he will. He loves you very much. And I love him. Even if I need to show him, I don't feel the way he does. With that, I turned down the hallway and slipped down the stairs, greeting the different workers along the way. Most said hello or just nodded. Some shrugged. One bowed. I gave that one a candy and told them to hold their head high. Nobody has a right to push them low. They flushed and ran away, which I took to mean that they didn't mind my little speech. Finally, I entered the throne room. My dad had just finished holding court for the day, and I slipped in just before the tide of people rushed out. Those who advised or had favorable decisions moving confidently, and those who were judged against or on stretchers or in caskets. Hello, father. Hail to the glorious son of our empire. Might I have a moment's audience? Hail to our empire's rising sun. What can I do for you, Alex? I know you always told me to be true to myself, and it's time I began to follow that. I'm not expecting you to understand, but I'm going to start making some changes, and I need you to know what I'm doing and why. Wait. Alex, are you saying what I think you're saying? He shifted higher in his chair and sweat began to form on his scarred chest, which he often left bare just to intimidate people. Knowing that he had left behind, what he had left behind and what it had done to him was his intent. It was time I left my own things behind. I'm going to start working toward an egalitarian society. Our empire suffers for the brutal way we handle things. Oh, well, son, I expect you might be telling me you were transitioning. If you want to work for a brighter tomorrow, go for it. Your generation will lead in the next few years. Work with Charles and Yvette to get your five and ten year plan sorted, and we'll start shuffling things around to make the transition. I'm so proud of my baby boy, all grown into the crown prince he was meant to be. Um, Dad? I'm not a prince. I transitioned years ago. Like I said, probably not the most creative way that I could have gone with it, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> glad to see you approve. Sunbeam, glad you got it. Laugh, Kefri. Oh, glad. Okay, <laughs> this just worked out, I guess. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. I'm glad you got a good chuckle out of it. Alright, let's see how people respond to this one then.
go. Feels a little silly doing this with my browser, but eh, what else are you gonna do? It was the eyes. I'd spent the last five years gazing into the loving eyes of dogs from all over town. The color and shape might change, but they always had that same bit of devotion, of a knowledge they belonged to someone. This one lacked all of it. Oh, uh, Sunbeam Cow, the password count in the corner. Um, every once in a while, uh, people, when they're watching me, uh, decide they need to mash their keyboard in embarrassment and frustration. Um, let's see, it most often happens if I do something like, Oh my, and just what do you think you're doing? Oh yeah, I see you there. Put that keyboard down. We both know what's going to come out of it. So, uh, when stuff like that happens and we end up with another password, I add one to the password count. <laughs> I also try not to do that too much. It's, uh, it's a low bar to set for people, and it's just... I want the focus to be on other things. But it's something that happens sometimes. So, uh, when it happens, the password count increments. Uh, normally, I keep it hidden. Earlier tonight, we had somebody trying to use uh, what I later for learned were uh, the names of emotes from other servers, and just Twitch wasn't having any of it. So instead of putting the emotes, it just put in this like long string of things. Uh, and so I, I mistook that for a password and figured people had started generating passwords early in the evening. So, uh, yeah. As Kefri's pointed out, some people enjoy it, some not so much. Um, it just depends on who's all here. And tonight, uh, we've mostly just had people who are here to enjoy some good stories. And I've been really enjoying getting to share these with people. So, yeah, that's, uh... I suppose you could put it that way, Mitz. Um, but the excitement is very specifically the kind that causes people to go in the uh, chat publicly. <laughs> it had the general parts of a dog. A long tail, four legs, a very snoot muzzle with teeth all along. And its fur was certainly brown. Reddish brown, similar to my teddy bear that was sitting on my bed next to me. But the dog didn't have dog eyes. It sniffed around the room, and although it seemed similar, its sniff wasn't quite right either. The sound came from the back of its throat, almost a cough, and the claws didn't clack right as the dog strode across the floor. <laughs> oh, Welsh counter. Oh, yes. Thank you, Sunbeam. Oh, I... I... I don't know how many people would actually catch that, but yes. <laughs> Usually we go with the joke of if you want a fresh password, uh, you just tell some very specific people that you're a good girl or a good boy and watch as the new password comes in. Um, but yes, we, we could also say watch as they switch over into speaking fluent Welsh. And the way it moved was wrong, too. I'd studied dog bones, dog muscles, and knew how dogs moved. This wasn't right. It scared me a little, but there was no sense arguing with my parents if they said it was a dog, and if I wanted a chance of having a real dog someday, I'd have to make do with this strange creature for now. And that meant coming up with a name. How about Titus? I asked out loud. My parents cooed and told me it was a very grown-up name for the dog, but the creature didn't seem happy as I said the word. Well, maybe not. I don't think he likes it. Can I talk with him for a bit and see what he does like? I asked, giving myself a little space. It would be terribly rude to name the creature something it didn't like. My parents agreed and left the room for us to get acquainted. Mm. Hydration. It's good for the body. And the throat. Which is part of the body, so I suppose it's covered in good for the body. At any rate, 
<laughs> Hello there. I can tell you're different. Do you talk at all? I prompted. It seemed reasonable to my nine-year-old self and surprised me a little when the creature came over and let out a great <sighs> as it plopped down before me. Its muzzle slid along the ground before coming to rest right in front of my shoe. The lace had come undone, and the creature slowly, methodically tugged at the laces until they came free. It slowly picked up one end of the lace and dragged it along until a single letter formed on the ground. R. I pulled out a little bit of paper from the mostly blank diary hidden under my pillow and began to write. O. G. E. R. With the last R formed in my diary, the creature piled the lace up in something that looked like a pretty done to me. It was slow, but it meant we could talk at least a little. Roger, so nice to meet you. I'll let my parents know your name. So, Roger, how did you get here? Roger huffed just a little, clearly stealing himself for another round of writing, and put the words, Got a job to do here with your older parent. A job? This was new. I knew my parents both had jobs, and sometimes worked with strange people, but I'd never seen either of them work with an otherworldly creature before. Hello, Naruto. Thank you for dropping in. It's good to see you. Oh, that sounds exciting. Is it a job I can help with, I asked, hopping off the bed? Sure. Call them in. I ran to the kitchen, waited for them to finish their kiss, then asked if they could come in with me real quick to see what the neat trick Roger could do. They looked at each other, surprised at my sudden enthusiasm, and followed me down the hall. Roger sat next to a pair of shoelaces, which wrote out in neat letters, It's, she's ready. It's time. I can't remember their faces well. Time and events have changed so much. I only remember them going pale, looking at each other, and crying, desperately begging Roger. Not yet. Please, just a little longer. She's so young. Roger stood, his full height drifting up to my chin, and stared my parents dead in the eyes. They held each other's gaze for a long moment, pain and anger and all sorts of other emotions for which I had no words passing between them in an instant, which stretched for eternity. Finally, one of my parents relented with a heavy sigh. No, sweetie. Oh no. Sweetie, I need you to follow my instructions. You're going away, and you won't be able to come back. The bottom dropped out of my stomach and my whole world spun. What do you mean I won't come back? What about my room? Mr. Bun Bun? What about you and my other parents? They simply bent down and gave me a warm, firm hug. The last one I would ever get from them. We knew when you came into our lives that you would one day leave to go to a special school. We love you and we'll miss you. This is what you need to do. All hunters have to grow up and start training one day. I nearly choked on the last word, and it was taking everything in them to keep their composure. My other parent bent down, picked me up, and set me on Roger's back. Yes, Roger, it's time. Just please don't take everything, even if it's just a little. We want to remain a part of her. Roger nodded, looking as gentle as I would ever see him and turned his head around to look me in the eyes. He opened his mouth, and his warm breath clouded my mind as the world slipped away. Uh, the prompt for this one was, You have always wanted a puppy, and finally your parents have agreed you are old enough to look after one. Unfortunately, the creature they brought home yesterday is not a puppy, and you are the only one that can see its true form. 
<laughs> you gave garlic to the doggy. You've never heard of dog breath before, Sunbeam Cow. I mean, that that's okay. Not everybody hears about all the things at the t same time, but ugh, dog breath. <laughs> what, what, Naruto? <laughs> Capri, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see here. Are who okay, Mitz? How does this have anything to do with a dog? Uh, so the first couple of lines in the prompt were, uh, it was the eyes. I'd spent the last five years gazing into the loving eyes of dogs from all over town. The color and shape might change, but there was always that same bit of devotion, of a knowledge they belonged to someone. This one lacked all of it. So, uh, the Roger creature that, uh, she's put on the back of, that's generally shaped like a dog, and her parents introduced it as a dog. <laughs> Mostly deal with flies when grazing in the meadows, you know? That's pretty delightful. <laughs> uh, da da da. Um. Trying to find the. For some reason, when I tried clicking on one of these, it didn't take me where I thought it would. So. Here we go. I think I found it. Uh. What do my comments look like for the previous story or are you asking about the comments themselves so the writing prompts community gives you a uh just like a general here's a thing you can use to get started with your writing um and uh so anything that i'm replying to here is a comment uh generally speaking if i get any comments on this writing from the community it's like one or two that are like yeah we really like this um, I don't typically get a lot in the way of responses to my stuff, um, so, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as I can tell, my stuff is pretty average for responses to writing prompts. If you like just reading decent writing, uh, it's actually a pretty cool community to, like, go through and read some of the stuff people have put up. Um, mm, excuse me, a little bit of a burp there. But yeah, I don't generally get a lot of feedback on my writing. Um, and as a reminder, if people are interested in uh, taking a look at the stuff that I've written, uh, that is a link to my uh, Reddit here. At least I think that's where that goes. Um, we can confirm this real quick. Yep. So just under comments, you can see all of the different stuff that I've written out and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, you're more than welcome to drop in. Uh, I always appreciate comments and feedback, things like, hey, this was really spooky, or nah, you know, this, this didn't work for me. Um, you know, I, I like getting to hear what people think of my work. Um, and as much as I do voice acting, I do a fair amount of writing as well. Um, most of that writing will never see the light of day. And that's just kind of the nature of things. Um, but if there is something that you're like, hey, I really like this. Like Mitz earlier got to see one of the, uh, do I write picture books or comics? Uh, no, my art skills are not up to that challenge by a good margin. Um, so I would need to either partner with an artist or uh, have somebody commissioned to do the art for my writing in order to make a proper comic out of it. Um, but I have also been known to narrate other people's comics, uh, from time to time on Discord, so, uh, if you're interested in something like that, I can always see if I can set up a community night or something like that. Uh, it doesn't work great for Twitch, though. And Sunbeam Cow, I'm delighted to hear that you're enjoying what you're hearing. 
Uh, whether it's because of the voice or the writing or all of the above, I I'm glad that it's something that you're appreciating. So, glad to have you here. And, uh, all right, I need a drink. Ah. All right, there's about a liter and a half of water down. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Tony and I sat across the table from the woman, who was sobbing into a handkerchief. Her story was a bit odd, to be sure, but normally I'd have dismissed it as a memory which had been eaten. Lots of fairly benign beings ate dreams and memories, so that wouldn't be worth a look. Tony thought the child was safe to be around and a wonderful person to spend time with, and the mother was delusional and dangerous. Drink responsibly, don't be a wizard. Yes. <laughs> of course, Tony had a very keen sixth sense about danger. If he thought it was safe, it was often an immediate threat to life, limb, and possibly sanity. The fact that mother perturbed him while the sun seemed cozy spoke volumes, and I wasn't about to let anything happen. So you told me the mirror was a gift from an old family friend? I prompted once the, her breathing became more stable. Yes, Uncle Charlie. We hadn't seen him in many years. Then he suddenly dropped by with a few gifts. The mirror and a few candies and a hat. He said they were from his travels to... She rambled on, letting me know all about the exotic lands Uncle Charlie had visited and how rarely he brought anything back other than stories. Lots of travel, but no ties to magic or most of the creatures that could make a convincing doppelganger. We left the mirror in the storage room. I don't know when my son began doing it in there, going in there, but he did mention shortly after that the mirror bothered him, that the boy within kept telling him horrible things. So it was alone when the mirror spoke to him. I was starting to get an idea of what had happened, and this would make for a solid bounty if I was right. Yes, he tried to show me several times, but it always seemed like a normal mirror to me. Gotcha. Tony, will you grab the kiddo and come with me to the storage room? I think I know how to solve this. Tony agreed enthusiastically, and my confidence in this plan dipped. Oh, uh... Yeah, yeah, um, I guess we can wrap up after this story. Sure, Joes. Uh, yeah, we we can raid him if you want. Um, just wait until we've finished, and then, uh, let me know, and I'll, I'll direct people over there. Uh, alright, uh, Tony agreed enthusiastically, and my confidence in this plan dipped a little. Still... I needed Tony to make sure the mirror didn't grab me as well, and he was better suited than the still distraught mother. Soon, Tony, the boy, and I were gathered in the storage room with the mirror. It was framed in gold, with engraved patterns around the edges. I saw the I sat the boy down in front of it and told him, Look, you need to give the kid his life back. Er, look, you need to give the kid back. It's a cute game, but he has a life to live. Some life. I'm sure you wondered how I might have gotten such a sweet child, given I cannot lie. The creature knew it had been caught and wasn't going to keep pretending to be the human at this stage. Nah, but I figure the kid can say after you go back in. Go on. You know it's not only my choice. The child must be willing to return. I rolled my eyes. As much as a little kid might be scared of mom, Tony's instincts told me enough to trust the lady is safe if a bit weepy for my taste. Look, we're not debating this. Tony, turn off the lights. He looked at me funny, but got up and clicked off the lights, leaving the room lit only by a few stray beams of light from the street lamp outside the window. I'm not sure how you think the dark will help, the creature began. Bloody Mary, I said. In the dim light, I saw the creature's face turn ghostly pale. You wouldn't. Not her. Not here! I looked the creature dead in the eyes and gestured it inside the mirror. You have any idea what she'll do to me if she gets summoned into my home? The kid will be tormented for ages, and when this body dies and I go back, bloody Mary. Please, no, I beg you, don't blood The surface of the mirror rippled, and a sound of splintering glass broke over the room. 
the mother, who had been standing outside the door, burst in at the sound, light falling on her child, whose mole was back on the right side. She ran over to hug the little one as I quietly shut the nearby travel case of clothes and held my finger to my lips while looking at the little one. I'm glad you have your kiddo back safe now. If it's all the same to you, I'm going to take the mirror with me. Is that alright? She nodded, and I quietly draped a sheet over the mirror before handing it to Tony to carry. We made our way out of the house and down the street. Thing I don't get is why he went into that place to begin with? Tony asked the night air as we walked down the road to the office. Well, there was exactly one open chest among bunches of boxes and old furniture there. I'm guessing it was to play with the gowns and heels in that chest. Tony nodded sagely then added, I hope she gets it figured out. And then, life can be hard when you have to hide. Would the mirror have been a safe place to stay? What do your instincts tell you? Safe as houses, he said contentedly. And I'm guessing we got the kid out just in time. Uh, no, not Tony Todd. Um, so, the characters, uh, the main character and then Tony as well are actually characters that I've been using for a couple of different short stories that I've written on Reddit. Um, Tony's name and pronoun changes a little bit depending on the story. Um, just, I figured why not try learning how to write a canonically gender fluid character. Um, and yeah, that's... Uh... Oh, you know when we're making a joke. Okay. I'm sorry, Naruto. I, I didn't know if that was just you weren't familiar with my writing or what, um, which is fine. Um, actually, kind of glad to hear that you know that much about my characters. That That's really cool. Um, <laughs> any rate. Yeah, we are sitting at right about three hours and 20 minutes. And... Uh, yeah, I, I had uh, one request for a raid target here. Um, oh, Sunbeam Cow, that's really nice of you to say. Thank you. <laughs> um, as things stand, I know Road to Dusk is currently working on a um, stream tonight alongside uh, Lexi Flair and Night Haze 95. Uh, the three of them have been. Uh, trying it, they are raising some awareness of some uh recent things that are happening in the united states uh that specifically target the lgbt community i have a lot of friends a lot of uh even some family that are part of the community and it matters quite a bit to me uh, can i become an armadillo i i mean i could figure out how to make that happen but why do you ask? Armadillo? Um, anyways. <laughs> um, Joes, are you still in the chat here? Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, alright. Um, cool. So, is, is Rhodes still streaming at this point? I, I haven't checked here. Um, Okay. Uh, yeah. Because why not? Why do I have white hair? Why not become an armadillo? I don't have white hair. My hair is periwinkle. Thank you very much, Naruto. <laughs> Any rates. Uh... Why not become an armadillo? I it, Because it takes a fair amount of prep work. Um, I certainly could, but I don't have a particular desire to. Um, is, is there some specific reason that you want me to be an armadillo? Well, okay. Um... Yeah, no, I, I got nothing for you there, Naruto. Um, I am sorry if my hair color was a bit of a distractor for you, though. Um, but yeah, no. Um, honestly, I'm kind of running out of uh, water here, too. So I am all legal. I'm delighted to hear that my voice was something that let you get some good rest. 
Uh, but we are wrapping up, uh, getting to the end here. Um, I would like to once again thank everybody who's dropped in. I was delighted to get a chance to share not only the adventures of Winnie the Pooh from start of stream, but also some of my personal writings with everybody and see that, yeah, the, this is stuff that other people enjoy. Um, it's given me some more confidence. I will try and make at least one of my streams in a given week, uh, reading over writings that I've done then. Um, as long as I can get enough time to make that happen, it's gonna happen. So, uh, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you Kefri for briefly being a mod and helping make sure that I was not mistaken that the polls just are not working. Um, really appreciate you guys coming out tonight. And uh, if there's anything else you have to say, uh, this is a good time. Otherwise, let's start getting a raid ready here. Thank you, Legal. I appreciate it. I don't know what the New World One Piece is, but uh, thank you for the hugs. Sunbeam, lovely to meet you. I do hope you'll drop back next time. Um, Holes only work for affiliates. Okay, so yes, uh, then in about one to two streams, I will have polls available. Uh, have a wonderful time. Uh, no, I did not know that, Naruto. And, uh... Hmm. I wonder why that didn't work. Normally it does. All right. Uh, so we are getting prepared to raid out to Road. Um, once again, thank you, everybody. It's been a lovely time. And I hope that I will see you next time when we've got uh, a few more things to share. So I'll be back when the day is new. And I'll have more ideas for you. And you'll have things you want to talk about, I will too.